While landmines have existed as a concept as early as the 13th century, when they were used by the Chinese to repel Mongol invasions, it's Imperial Germany that is credited with making the advances that led to modern landmines as we understand them. Utilized extensively during World War I by the Germans, the weapons proved to be so effective that they were rapidly copied and deployed by all the major superpowers involved in the conflict. When Hitler assumed power of Germany in 1933, landmine technology was once again pushed to the forefront of military research, and this brings us to the topic of today. Variously called the Shrapnel Mine 35, Shrapnel Mine 35, Splinter Mine, or Bouncing Betty, the S Mine, as it was officially dubbed in Allied memos, was a deceptively simplistic weapon that one Lieutenant Colonel C. E. E. Sloan dubbed the most feared device encountered by Allied troops in the war. Physically, the mine resembled a small cylinder inside of which was either powdered or poured TNT. On top of each mine was a fuse which, when sprung, caused the explosive inside to detonate. The thing that set the S-Mine apart from similar devices was that rather than exploding immediately, it was designed to implode around four seconds after being tripped. Another key distinguishing feature of the S-Mine, and the one that made it so lethally effective, is that instead of detonating in the ground, its fuse was designed to launch the body of the mine about three feet into the air, at which point it would violently explode. To maximize lethality, the body of the S-Mine was filled with hundreds of steel ball bearings that would be launched outwards at high speeds. The capacity for destruction of the S-Mine cannot be understated here, and while the exact lethal range of the mine isn't clear, a 1943 U.S. Army field manual claims that it could inflict casualties as far away as 460 feet from the point of detonation. That said, perhaps due to their hastily constructed nature, the German military produced nearly two million of these things during World War II alone, the quality of the mine varied dramatically. As a result, more often than not, the mine would simply severely maim rather than outright kill. This is doubly terrifying in a weapon that was explicitly designed to detonate at testicle height, and in fact, it's for this exact reason that British soldiers sometimes refer to the S mine as the D Bollocker, Bollock being slang for testicles. Other similar nicknames adopted by the Allies for the device included the Bouncing Bitch, or more succinctly, the Castrator. However, as noted, the most common name among Allied soldiers for the mine was the Bouncing Betty, a name originally coined by American troops. Incidentally, due to the fact that these mines didn't detonate until they were a few feet in the air and launched down shrapnel at a mostly horizontal angle, injury from S mines could sometimes be avoided by immediately laying down once the mine was triggered. In any event, the first known Allied encounter with the S mine occurred during the Saar Offensive in 1939, shortly after the start of World War II. German forces mined the region so heavily that a French offensive, apparently that's a thing, into German territory was halted in its tracks. Shocker. Said soldiers reported the mine's existence and effectiveness to their superiors along with their own personal nickname for it, the Silent Soldier. As this mine was developed during the Third Reich, records about its origins are understandably hard to come by, but we do know that it was developed sometime in 1935, hence Shrapnel Mine 35. Throughout the war, Nazi engineers continued to make improvements to the already deadly device, culminating in the creation of a glass version of the mine, unimaginatively dubbed the Glass Mine 43 that was developed in, you guessed it, 1943. Along with being largely undetectable to mine detectors of the time, the glass mine carried an increased risk of infection, partially thanks to the fact that the glass shrapnel was harder for x-rays to detect, making operating on a person injured by it that much more difficult. Beyond German forces planting the S mines like grass seed pretty much everywhere they thought Allied soldiers might come near, they also cleverly peppered S mines around anti tank and anti vehicle mines so that soldiers inside of the vehicles disabled by them would either be killed by the S mines when exiting the ruined vehicle or have to stay put. Due to the extreme density of these mines in certain regions, even when particular Allied troops had the ability to detect the mines, which was a big if considering mine detection equipment was in short supply throughout the war, proceeding through Mindsland was exceptionally difficult and slow going. At times, this became so bad that progress into German-held territory 
it just stopped entirely. As an example of how saturated some areas were with mines, after D-Day, and we're going to get into what the D and D-Day stands for in a moment, Allies found and removed 15,000 unexploded mines from the dunes around Popperville alone. Further, after World War II, Allied forces conscripted some 49,000 German POWs to remove as many mines as they could throughout Western Europe. Yet even with this massive amount of manpower and meticulously kept Nazi maps of where the mines were planted, there are still areas today, particularly in North Africa and certain parts of Eastern Europe, that are considered unsafe to travel on because there may still be some functional, undetected World War II era mines located there. As you can probably guess, given the Bouncing Betty's brutal effectiveness, the design of the mine was quickly reverse engineered and derivatives were extensively created by numerous countries. However, due to the fact that the devices cause such horrific, debilitating injuries and a buried, forgotten mine is just as dangerous to your own people as to your enemies, few countries today still use mines of any design in combat. Notable exceptions to this include Russia and the People's Republic of China. Incidentally, beyond being an extremely deadly mine, the Shrapnel Mine 35 also gave birth to a common myth about landmines, and that's that such mines only detonate when the person who set it off steps off the trigger. This is a myth that became widespread spread during the war and likely originated due to the fact that the S mine was made to detonate a few seconds after being triggered, making it appear to not go off until the person stepped away. In reality, the mine was designed to detonate whenever a weight of more than 15 pounds hit the ground anywhere near it. Let's get into those bonus facts. The Battle of Normandy, also known as D-Day, started on June 6, 1944, and was the beginning of the major invasion of German-occupied Western Europe during World War II. But why was it called D-Day? You first might be inclined to think that the abbreviation is similar to V-Day, Victory Day. Indeed, one commonly touted explanation given for the meaning of the D&D &D Day is that it stands for Designated Day. Others claim that it stands for Decision Day or Deparkation Day, or some even claim that it stands for Deliverance Day. Even General Dwight Eisenhower, or at least his assistant, weighed in when Eisenhower received a letter asking for an explanation of the meaning of D-Day. His executive assistant wrote back stating D-Day was a shortened version of Departed Day. Given Eisenhower helped plan it, that should mean case closed, right? Well, it turns out most historians think not. And indeed, the evidence at hand doesn't seem to support Eisenhower's, or perhaps just his assistant's, claim. Hints of the true meaning can be found long before World War II in a U.S. Army field order dated the 7th of September 1918. The First Army will attack at H hour on D-Day with the object of forcing the evacuation of the St. Michal salient. In that context, and with numerous combat operations that followed over the years, D-Day referred to the day on which a combat attack would occur, with H hour likewise referring to the hour when an attack is scheduled to happen. Thus, the D is just a placeholder or variable for the actual date, and probably originally was meant to stand for date or day, if anything, if the associated H hour is any indication. The use of D-Day allows military personnel to easily plan for a combat mission ahead of time without knowing the exact date that it will occur. Given that planning for the most famous of all D-Days in June of 1944 started way back in 1943 and that, due to factors like optimal tides, only a few days in a given month were suitable for the launch of the invasion, trying to fix a firm date in the planning process was pointless, even close to the time of the attack. In fact, the original date was June the 5th, but bad weather at the last minute forced a day delay. By simply assigning the attack to occur on D-Day, it solved the issue and had the side benefit of keeping the date of the attack a secret as long as possible, just one of the many methods of deception the military employed to try and confuse the German brass with regards to the pending invasion. As for handling the pre-D-Day preparations and the plan for after, adding a plus or minus sign and a number after the D was used. For example, D-1 would indicate the day before the operation occurring, while D-3 would mean three days after the operation. In this way, the plans could be easily overlaid onto a calendar when the military leadership decided on the day of the attack. If the day needed to be switched at the last minute, it was then also easy enough to calibrate the plan to the new date. As alluded to, the D-Day that occurred on June 6, 1944 was not the only D-Day during World War II, and it certainly was not the last, as this method for planning of military operations continues to this day. Of course, because the D-Day at the Battle of Normandy was and continues to be the most famous of all given that designation, it seems unlikely in the foreseeable future that it will be usurped in people's minds when someone mentions D-Day, despite the military continuing to occasionally use this designation.
On August 6, 1945, the American B-29 bomber Enola Gay flew over the Japanese city of Hiroshima and dropped a single 4,000 kilogram uranium bomb called Little Boy. Seconds later, the bomb detonated with the equivalent power of 15,000 tons of TNT, destroying 8 square kilometers of the city and killing an estimated 90 to 140,000 people. Three days later, the B-29 box car drops the 5,000 kilogram Fat Man plutonium bomb on the city of Nagasaki, killing a further 30 to 80,000 people. The age of nuclear weapons, which would cast its shadow over the following century and beyond, had begun. But while the atomic bombs have become inextricably linked with the war in the Pacific, they were initially intended for use not against Japan, but rather Germany. From its inception, the vast scientific and industrial undertaking known as the Manhattan Project was built around fear. Fear the Nazi Germany would be the first to develop an atomic bomb, placing in the hands of Adolf Hitler the ultimate weapon of terror and mass destruction. But how close were the Germans to actually developing the bomb, and is it possible that the Second World War could have ended very, very differently? The Allies had good reason to fear that Germany was far ahead in the race to build an atomic bomb. After all, over the course of the war, German scientists would produce some of the most advanced weapons the world had ever seen, including the first jet fighters and ballistic missiles. It was also German scientists who first discovered the principle of nuclear fission. In December 1938, chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Straussmann bombarded a sample of uranium with neutron particles, generating atoms of the much lighter element barium. Suspecting that the neutrons had split or fissioned the uranium nuclei into smaller pieces, Hahn contacted his former colleague, Lise Meidner, who, as a Jew, had fled Germany for Sweden. Meidner, along with her nephew, Otto Frisch, soon developed a theoretical explanation for fission, and in January 1939 conducted experiments confirming Hahn and Straussmann's results. Hahn and Straussmann, however, had already submitted their findings to the scientific journal Nature Wissenschaften. The implications of this discovery were immediately obvious, and in April 1939, a secret meeting of German scientists was convened in Berlin to discuss the possible application of nuclear energy. During this meeting, the possibility was raised of building an atomic bomb, prompting chemist Paul Hartegg to write a memo to the German War Office, or Reichswehr, stating that an explosive many orders of magnitude more powerful than the conventional ones could give that country, which first makes use of it, an unsurpassable advantage. The theoretical feasibility of such a weapon was further confirmed by physicist Hans Geiger, and the Reichswehr agreed to fund a formal nuclear research program. On September 1, 1939, the Second World War erupted as German forces stormed into Poland. At the end of that month, a second meeting of scientists was convened by physicist Kurt Debner, attended by such luminaries as Abraham Eassu, Walter Gerlach, Erich Schumann, Walter Botha, Klaus Clusius, and Nobel laureate Werner Heisenberg, the most famous scientist in Germany at the time. By the end of the meeting, the attendees agreed to focus their efforts on three main goals essential to the development of an atomic bomb. The construction of a functioning nuclear reactor or uranium machine, the separation of uranium isotopes and research into fast neutron fission. While officially designated the Uran Project, or Uranium Project, the German nuclear program became known among its members by the less formal name of Uran Verein, or Uranium Club. And as German forces continued to storm across Europe, the Uranium Club steadily acquired the fruits of conquest. Large stockpiles of uranium from Belgium, a cyclotron particle accelerator from France, and a heavy water production plant in Norway. The various scientists who had fled Europe to escaped Nazi persecution, watched these developments with mounting apprehension. Among these were Albert Einstein and his Hungarian colleague Leo Szilard, who, on August 2, 1939, just one month before the German invasion of Poland, drafted a letter to US President Franklin D. Roosevelt warning him of the grave danger posed by the German nuclear program. It read, In the course of the last four months, it has been made possible to set up a nuclear chain reaction in a large mass of uranium, by which vast amounts of power and large quantities of new radiation like elements would be generated. Now it appears almost certain that this could be achieved in the immediate future. This new phenomenon would also lead to the construction of bombs, and it is conceivable, though much less certain, that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may thus be constructed. A single bomb of this type carried by boat and exploded in a port might very well destroy the whole port together with some of the surrounding territory. 
This letter, along with similar warnings from other scientists, ultimately convinced Roosevelt to approve in 1942 what became known as the Manhattan Project, with Army Corps of Engineers General Leslie Groves and physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer as its administrative and scientific directors, respectively. And for more on Einstein and Szilard's other, more unexpected collaboration, please check out our previous video. That time Albert Einstein decided to try revolutionizing keeping food cold. At the time of the Manhattan Project's inception, though, many scientists despaired that the Allies were at least one to two years behind the Germans in nuclear research, with physicist Leona Marshall Libby recalling, I think everyone was terrified that we were wrong and the Germans were ahead of us. Germany led the civilized world in physics in every aspect. At the time war set in when Hitler levered the boom, it was a very frightening time. A lack of reliable intelligence sources, however, prevented the Allies from gauging the progress of the German atomic bomb project. But the Manhattan Project thus became a blind race against an unseen enemy whose actual capabilities could only be guessed at. Over the next three years, some $32 billion and 500,000 personnel, nearly 1% of the entire U.S. labor force would be poured into beating the Germans to the finish line. As General Groves later wrote, unless and until we had positive knowledge to the contrary, we had to assume that the most competent German scientists and engineers were working on an atomic program with the full support of their government and with the full capacity of German industry at their disposal. Any other assumption would have been unsound and dangerous. Indeed, the few scraps of intelligence the Allies were able to gather proved less than encouraging. In September 1941, Werner Heisenberg paid a visit to Danish physicist Niels Bohr at his home in Copenhagen. The purpose of the visit is the subject of considerable debate, with some historians claiming Heisenberg wanted to recruit Bohr into the German atomic bomb project, and others that he tried to convince the Allies via Bohr to abandon their own nuclear program. What is known is that A. Bohr angrily expelled Heisenberg from his home and never spoke to him again, and B. During during their meeting, Heisenberg sketched for Bohr a simple diagram of a nuclear reactor. When Bohr was later evacuated from Denmark by the British, he handed over the sketch to Allied intelligence, who took it as evidence that the Germans were far ahead in their nuclear research. It was not until after the D-Day landings in June 1944 that Allied intelligence finally began to pull back the curtain on the German Uran project. The year before, U.S. Army intelligence launched the ALSOS mission under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Boris T. Pash. Armed with a handful of jeeps and light weapons, ALSOS's mission was to drive deep behind enemy lines and gather what information it could on the German nuclear project. But no matter how far they penetrated into occupied Europe and Germany itself, Colonel Push and his men could find no evidence of the industrial-scale uranium enrichment facilities needed to produce an atomic bomb. And the few nuclear research facilities they did find were small-scale affairs run by university physics and chemistry departments. Finally, however, the ARSOS mission seemed to hit the jackpot when they discovered a full-scale nuclear reactor hidden in a beer cellar in the southern German town of Hegelach. But when the reactor itself was examined and the scientists involved in its construction interrogated, it became clear that the Germans had never succeeded in achieving a sustained nuclear chain reaction. As the war in Europe finally came to an end and the available evidence was gathered, the ALSOS mission came to a startling conclusion. The Germans never came close to developing a working atomic bomb. None of the Uranium Club's research on nuclear fission ever made it past the small-scale experimental stage, and the whole project was ultimately scrapped when the German High Command realized it was would never contribute to the final outcome of the war. In an instant, the spectre of a German atomic bomb, the bogeyman that had kick-started the sustained and gargantuan Manhattan Project, seemed to evaporate into thin air. So, what happens? Why, despite having a two-year head start over the Allies, did the German atomic bomb project ultimately fizzle out? There were many contributing factors, all of which illustrate the stark contrast between how scientific and technical development was carried out in Nazi Germany and the Allied nations. The first nail in the coffin for the German atomic bomb project was the ruthless politicization of German science under the Nazi regime. By the time the Second World War broke out, the Nazis had thoroughly purged Germany's universities and research institutions of Jews, communists, and other political undesirables. Some 1,145 people, or 14% of all higher educational staff. These included such superstars as Albert Einstein, Erwin Schrödinger, Hans Bertha, Eugene Wigner, Edward Teller, John von Neumann and Otto Frisch, many of whom emigrated to the United States and became key figures in the Manhattan Project. Not even Werner Heisenberg was immune from Nazi suspicion. In 1938, Heisenberg came under attack from Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, who denounced him as a white Jew for his work on quantum theory and suggested that he should be made to disappear. His reputation and career were only saved via the intervention of his mother, who happened to be old friends with the Himmlers. 
As a result of this intervention, Himmler realized that Germany could ill afford to lose such a great scientist and wrote Heisenberg a letter warning him to keep his physics and his politics separate. Such purges, along with Nazi belief that atomic theory, quantum theory, and other recent developments constituted degenerate Jewish physics, ultimately left Germany with few specialists capable of directing a successful nuclear research project. Kind of shot yourself in the foot with that one, didn't you guys? Furthermore, many of the scientists who remained in Germany were drafted into the armed forces, further reducing the scientific and technical capital available to the nation. Another factor which ultimately sank the German atomic program was the convoluted and inefficient manner in which technical and scientific development was managed in Nazi Germany. Unlike in allied nations like the United States, where the government decided which weapons were worth pursuing and assigned contracts to the companies best suited to completing them, in Germany, multiple private firms, government departments, and branches of the armed forces competed with each other for limited resources and contracts. This was a deliberate divide-and-conquer tactic on the part of Hitler and his cronies, as it encouraged different governments and military branches to bicker among themselves instead of conspiring against the regime. The system was also the product of the Nazis trying to square a particularly troublesome ideological circle. While the Nazis understood the advantages of free market capitalism, they considered this an undesirable Jewish-American system and developed a strange hybrid arrangement of free enterprise and government control in an attempt to reconcile this contradiction. In practice, however, this led to the wasteful duplication of effort and the squandering of limited resources. For example, by the end of the war, there were 86 different rocket projects in development, few of which ever reached operational status. Had the most promising of these projects been combined and assigned to a single contractor, as in the Allied model, development would have likely proceeded much more efficiently. Similarly, at one point, there were no less than three separate and independent nuclear research programs split up among nine research institutes in Berlin, Leipzig, and Castle. According to German historian Klaus Herschel, compared with the British and American war research efforts united in the Manhattan Project to this day the prime example of big science, the Euro Verein was only a loosely knit decentralized network of researchers with quite different research agendas. Rather than teamwork as on the American ends, on the German side we find cutthroat competition, personal rivalries, and fighting over limited resources. But even if the German nuclear project had been amalgamated into a single coordinated effort, it would still have been doomed by a lack of official government interest and support. While the Reichswehr saw the military potential of nuclear fission early on, by mid-1940 that interest was rapidly fading as Germany's rapid conquest of Western Europe convinced many in the high command that the war would be won by 1942. This, along with the slow technical progress being made by the Iranian club, convinced the Reichswehr that nuclear research would not contribute to ending the war in the short term. The the project was thus handed over to the Reich Research Council in January 1942 and assigned a low priority. The goals of the project were also simplified from building an atomic bomb to building a nuclear reactor for research, energy generation, and possibly naval propulsion. The situation was not helped by the fact that Adolf Hitler, who had no background in science and technology, neither understood nor appreciated the potential of nuclear energy and gravitated instead towards less abstract wonder weapons like giant railway guns and ballistic missiles. The upshot of all of this was that, compared to the Manhattan Project, the German Uranium Club was woefully underfunded and understaffed, receiving the equivalent of only $2 million in government funds and employing a maximum of 100 researchers. Its American equivalent, by contrast, employed 5,000 times more personnel and received 16,000 times more funding. And as the war dragged on, the Uranium Club would only get smaller. Its Uranium stockpiles diverted to make armor-piercing ammunition, and its scientists assigned to more pressing military projects. But the single greatest factor which ultimately sank the German atomic bomb project was, ironically, a lack of German scientific expertise. Despite Allied fears that the Germans were years ahead in nuclear research, by the time the Manhattan Project got underway in early 1942, British and American scientists had already pulled far ahead of their German counterparts. This was largely due to the aforementioned political purge of German intelligentsia, which left the country with a shortage of experts on nuclear physics. This, in turn, led to German scientists making a number of key errors that doomed the whole undertaking from the very start. For example, to build a working nuclear reactor, one needs not only uranium as fuel, but also a material called a moderator. The moderator slows down neutrons produced by nuclear fission to the optimum energy needed
needed to produce additional fissions, thus sustaining the chain reaction. The world's first nuclear reactor, Chicago Par 1, used bricks of graphite, an ultra-pure form of carbon. However, this material was ruled out in the early German program when a calculation error led physicist Walter Both to conclude that it absorbed too many neutrons to be a practical moderator. This left only one choice, heavy water, a form of water in which some of the hydrogen is replaced by the heavier isotope deuterium. In this case, there was only one source of heavy water in Europe, the Vermok Norsk's hydro plant in Telemark, Norway, where heavy water was generated as a byproduct of fertilizer production. The Germans invaded Norway in April 1940 and immediately began producing heavy water for their nuclear reactor project. The Allies, recognizing the strategic importance of the plant, launched a series of attacks, including a February 1943 raid by Norwegian commandos codenamed Operation Gunnerside, which succeeded in blowing up the heavy water production equipment. The Germans abandoned production and attempted to ship the remaining heavy water out of Norway, but were thwarted when the Norwegian resistance bombs and sank the ferry, carrying the barrels across Lake Tim. As a result of this sabotage, German scientists working on reactors were left with a very limited quantity of poor quality moderator, meaning the original design of 664 three-inch uranium cubes suspended on wires no longer had adequate critical mass to sustain a chain reaction. Then in December 1942, shortly after Chicago PAR-1 first achieved criticality, air leaked into the German L4 reactor in Leipzig and ignited the uranium fuel, starting a fire that boiled the coolant and caused the reactor to explode. The entire facility was destroyed, forcing it to be abandoned. Abandoned. There were other problems as well. Building a practical atomic bomb requires separating the rare fissile isotope uranium-235 from the far more abundant but non-fissile isotope uranium-238. This is a slow and highly energy-intensive process, so much so that the Manhattan Project, running three different enrichment processes simultaneously in some of the largest industrial facilities ever constructed, only managed to enrich enough uranium for a single bomb, and even then only after the war in Europe had ended. While the Germans experimented with various separation methods, they quickly realized that Germany simply lacked the resources and industrial might to enrich enough uranium within a reasonable time frame. With one scientist exclaiming upon learning of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it must have taken factories large as the United States to make that much uranium-235. The only other option for building a bomb was to breed the fissile isotope plutonium-239 from uranium-238 in a reactor, but the Germans seem to have been unaware of this process, and in any case never managed to get even a simple reactor working. Furthermore, even the more knowledgeable German scientists like Werner Heisenberg were unfamiliar with the fast neutron fission physics fundamental to the functioning of an atomic bomb, and thus would likely have been unable to build a functioning weapon, even if they had managed to enrich sufficient uranium. In conclusion, the German project failed because, unlike the Manhattan project, Project, it had nowhere near enough manpower, resources, centralization, government support, and technical backing. In short, it never stood a chance. Over the years, a myth has arisen that the German nuclear program failed due to internal sabotage. According to this theory, leading scientists like Werner Heisenberg were opposed to developing nuclear weapons on moral grounds and actively worked to stall the project and deny Hitler the bomb. However, this notion appears to have been fabricated by these scientists in order to rehabilitate their post-war reputations with historian and author Richard Rhodes concluding that there was at least one speculation that one of the German scientists deliberately falsified the measurements in graphite, hoping to stop a German bomb program. I don't think there's really evidence to support that. It seems to have been a mistake in the course of developing these various components of the technology. In the end, the German atomic bomb, which had so frightened the Allies, turned out to be nothing but a mirage, a half-hearted attempt mortally hobbled by the bureaucracy, ineptitude, and ideological corruption of the Nazi regime. But despite the fact that Adolf Hitler never came close to possessing nuclear weapons, the German project nonetheless had a profound impact on the post-war world order. Had the Allies known the true extent of German nuclear research, they might not have poured such vast resources into the Manhattan Project. The atomic bomb would not have been developed until years or even decades decades later, and the world as we know it will be a very different place. In the early morning hours of August the 19th, 1942, an armada of 237 ships appeared off the coast of northern France. Aboard was a raiding force of 6,100 men, mostly Canadians, along with five battalions of elite British commandos, Royal Marines, and American Rangers. Their objective was to capture and briefly hold the coastal resort town of Dieppe. 
For months, the Soviet Union had pressured the British and Americans to open a second front in Europe, relieving some of the pressure on the beleaguered Red Army. Doing so, however, would require capturing an intact port, essential for delivering the vast amounts of men and supplies needed to sustain an invasion. The Dieppe raid, codenamed Operation Jubilee, would demonstrate the feasibility of such an operation. The 4,900 men of the 2nd Canadian Division, eager for action after months of training, were confident of success. Their commander, Major General J. H. Roberts, declaring, Don't worry, boys, it'll be a piece of cake. He could not have been more wrong. At 4 a.m., the landing ships carrying number 3 commando stumbled into a flotilla of German torpedo boats, resulting in a brief exchange of fire. While the enemy vessels were scattered, the German coastal defenses were now altered to the raiders' presence. Thus, when the Allied landing craft finally hit the beach, the enemy was waiting for them. What followed was chaos and slaughter. Dieppe was surrounded by high chalk cliffs, atop which the Germans had placed dozens of machine gun nests and mortar batteries pre-sighted to rake the beaches with deadly accuracy. Wave after wave of soldiers stormed out of their landing craft into the surf, only to be cut down by withering fire. Tanks struggled to advance up the beach, their tracks spinning uselessly on the loose shingle, while those that managed to reach the town found all the entrances blocked and they were picked off one by one. In the absence of adequate Allied air cover, the German Luftwaffe mercilessly strafed and bombed the beaches, inflicting horrific casualties. About the only success of the day was enjoyed by the men of No. 4 Commando, who managed to blow up the gun batteries of Esterival, Sumer, and Varangeville in a textbook operation. But it was too little too late. At 9.40 a.m., the signal to retreat was given, and the remaining men were withdrawn from the beach. They left behind 1,421 dead and 1,946 captured, more than half of the entire raiding force. Though it came at a horrendous cost, the Dieppe raid taught the Allies a vital lesson. Ports were too easily defended and could not be counted upon in a future invasion. Instead, the Allies would have to learn how to land and supply themselves on open beaches. Doing so, however, would require specialist equipment, including landing craft that could sail right up to the beach, discharge their load of men or vehicles, and then immediately unteach themselves and return to the landing fleet. Just such a vehicle would come from an unexpected source, a bull-necked, foul-mouthed, hard-drinking, freewheeling boatbuilder from New Orleans named Andrew Higgins. In one of the most astonishing feats of the Second World War, in just five short years, Higgins grew his tiny company into an industrial juggernaut that, by the end of the war, would produce over 20,000 landing craft, nearly 92% of the U.S. Navy's entire wartime fleet. Sturdy, maneuverable, and dependable in even the heaviest surf, these humble little vessels served with distinction nearly every theater of the conflict and completely revolutionized amphibious warfare, prompting Allied Supreme Commander General Dwight D. Eisenhower to declare Andrew Higgins the man who won the war for us. This is the extraordinary story of the landing craft vehicle personnel, LCVP, better known as the Higgins Boat. Andrew Jackson Higgins was born on the 28th of August, 1886, in Columbus, Nebraska, the youngest of ten children born to attorney John Higgins and his wife Annie O'Connor. From an early age, Andrew Higgins displayed the hustle and drive that would characterize his later business career, running small grass-cutting and newspaper delivery services, and hiring local boys as employees. He was also pugnacious and distrustful authority, being expelled from Creighton Prep High School in Omaha for getting into one too many brawls. At an early age, Higgins demonstrated a passion and genius for boat design, building an ice boat that could reach up to 96 kilometers an hour on frozen lakes. This passion was further stoked by his service in the Nebraska National Guard, where he gained experience loading and offloading troops from small boats along the Platte River. After many summers spent working in Wyoming logging camps in 1906, Higgins decided to go into business for himself and moved to Mobile, Alabama to establish a lumber import business. Unfortunately, after just a few years, a hurricane destroyed most of Higgins' assets, prompting him to move to New Orleans, where he became manager of a German-owned lumber importing firm. In 1922, he formed his own company, Company, Higgins Lumber and Export Co., purchasing a large tract of land near Natchez, Mississippi, to harvest bald cypress and pine. The land was crisscrossed with numerous rivers, lakes, and swamps, making the trees difficult to access and transport. To solve this problem, in 1926, Higgins developed a new type of small boat, ideal for use on the rivers and bios of the Gulf Coast. Dubbed the Eureka Boat, the 30 foot craft featured a shallow draft and a specially curved spoonbill bow with a solid pine block or headlog that allowed it to power over logs and other debris without damaging the hull. The propeller and shaft were also housed in a half tunnel cut into the bottom of the hull, protecting them from fouling and damage and allowing the Eureka boat to easily back itself off the shore. In demonstrations, Higgins showed off the Eureka boat's impressive performance by effortlessly sailing over one meter diameter logs and large clumps of water hyacinth and even climbing over the seawalls of Lake Pontchartrain. The timing of Higgins's invention was fortuitous. For foreign competition and a slump in the lumber market, it left him with few remaining contracts and a surplus of mahogany. 
Lee, the ideal wood for boat building. Higgins thus shifted his business from lumber towards boat building, a transition finalized in 1930 with the creation of Higgins Industries. The Eureka boat found many enthusiastic buyers, including the Coast Guard and Army Corps of Engineers, who used it effectively to rescue people from floods along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, as well as the many oil prospectors, loggers, and fur trappers who operated in the Gulf Coast waterways. It was especially popular with Prohibition era rum runners, allowing them to travel and hide in small, seldom used channels. But the Eureka boat was not perfect. The shape of the hull, while ideal for skimming over obstacles, funneled water saturated with air bubbles towards the propeller, reducing its efficiency and limiting the boat's top speed to 10 knots. Fortuitously, a happy accident on the molding floor solved the problem, creating an improved hull shape that pushed debris and aerated water away from the propeller. This allowed Higgins' boats to reach ever higher speeds. In 1930, a Higgins designed craft named And How 3 shaved three hours off the 90 hour New Orleans to St. Louis speed record, a nearly 2,000 kilometer journey through twisting rivers. An order of 20 Eureka boats by the government of the Netherlands solidified Higgins' reputation as a master small boat designer, but there was one client he was especially eager to court the military. Convinced that the Navy doesn't know one damn thing about small boats, Higgins foresaw the need for vast flotillas of light craft capable of carrying troops, vehicles, and equipment from transport ships directly onto the beach. Indeed, in the mid-1930s, the U.S. Marine Corps was actively seeking such a craft, standard Navy launches having proven, as Higgins had predicted, unsuited to the task. The unique challenges of amphibious landings had been known for some time. The failure of the 1915 Gallipoli, when the British Empire and French forces attempted to capture the Dardanelles Strait from the Ottoman Empire, was partially blamed on the time it took to transfer troops and equipment from transport ships to the beach using ordinary launches, time that allowed the Turks to dig in and repel the invaders. In response, the British created the world's first modern troop landing craft. Designated X-lighters and nicknamed Beatles by the troops, the vessels were 100 feet long and featured a spoon-shaped bow and a drop-down bow ramp, allowing them to sail up to the beach and quickly offload up to 500 men and their equipment. 200 were built before the war ended in 1918. Other nations soon adopted similar designs, including Imperial Imperial Russia's El Pitafor class landing ship introduced in 1916, and Imperial Japan's Daihatsu class introduced in 1924, and used extensively in operations against China in 1932 and 1937. However, the interwar leader in landing craft design remained Britain, which in 1926 introduced the motor landing craft or MLC. With a draft of only two meters, the MLC was capable of delivering the heaviest tanks of the time directly up to the beach and featured a unique water jet propulsion system to prevent the propeller from getting fouled. Two more advanced British designs the Landing Craft Mechanized, or LCM, and Landing Craft Tank, or LCT, were developed in 1941 and would serve with distinction throughout the Second World War. In 1939, a smaller craft was introduced for landing troops known as the Landing Craft Assault, or LCA. 42 feet long, the LCA could carry 36 fully loaded troops who disembarked down a narrow ramp at the bow. Flanking this ramp were two armored cubicles for the helmsman and a machine gunner, while armor plates were fitted to the sides to protect the occupants from small arms fire and shrapnel. While the LCA had a share of flaws, the narrow ramp, for example, tended to bottleneck troops exiting the craft, making them vulnerable to enemy fire. It had many advantages over later, more modern landing craft, such as bench seats for troops, better armor protection, and engines which exhausted into the water, making the craft extremely quiet. For this reason, the LCA was the preferred landing craft for British commandos, American rangers, and other special forces. Indeed, the Ranger attack on Omaha Beach, depicted in the opening of the 1997 film Saving Private Ryan, was conducted using British LCAs, not LCBPs. The United States Navy, by contrast, was slow to adopt a modern landing craft, despite Andrew Higgins's repeated attempts to interest them in his impressive Eureka boat. Much of this reluctance stemmed from tradition and bureaucratic inertia. The Navy's own Bureau of Construction and Repair, or BCR, was accustomed to dealing with established northern shipyards and was loath to work with a tiny southern boat builder like Higgins Industries. At the urging of the Marine Corps, however, in 1936, the Navy agreed to hold a competitive trial of potential landing craft designs at Cape May, New Jersey. To the Navy's dismay, the BCR designs proved almost impossible to handle in rough surf, with one vessel nearly capsizing. Only Higgins' Eureka boat performed flawlessly, prompting the commanding officer of the 5th Marine Regiment to declare, Navy standard boats are totally unsuited for landing troops, even under moderate surf conditions. They are in no sense tactical vehicles, lacking in speed and maneuverability, and are extremely difficult to handle in surf. They do not permit rapid disembarkation of troops at the water's edge. Reluctantly, in May 1938, the Navy agreed to fund the 
construction of a prototype 30-foot landing craft based on the Eureka boat. However, while the prototype cost $12,000 to build, the Navy only paid Higgins $5,200, placing Higgins Industries in dire financial straits. Worse still, despite the prototype's impressive performance in trials of Virginia Beach, the entrenched Navy bureaucracy once again rejected the design, giving the rather dubious excuse that, quote, the Higgins boat is too heavy, the speed too slow. All Higgins boats have 250 horsepower, with accompanying excessive gasoline consumption for the speed obtained. In response, Higgins traveled to Washington, D.C. to plead his case to the BCR. Upon seeing the blueprints of the competing BCR design, in true Higgins fashion, he proceeded to scribble across them, this boat stinks, AJH. The situation finally began to change in September 1939, as the Second World War broke out in Europe. Though the United States was officially neutral, military planners recognized that the country would inevitably be drawn into the conflict and that more modern equipment would be needed. The search for a new landing craft thus began in earnest. Meanwhile, Andrew Higgins continued to improve the Eureka boat design, stretching it to 36 feet to increase capacity and improve speed and handling. An unconventional, blunt, and decidedly unsubtle businessman, Higgins was so sure of his new design that despite his death desperate need for more orders, he actively encouraged clients to cancel their orders with the older 30-foot model. In a strange twist of fate, it was the last-minute change of the design which finally secured Higgins' name in military history, for the standard Navy troop jets of the time just happened to have launching davits exactly 36 feet long. Following further trials in 1939, the Navy was finally forced to admit that the Eureka boat was the superior design, and in 1940 officially adopted it as the Landing Craft Personnel Large, or LCPL. The LCPL first saw service with the British in 19. 40, who dubbed it the T-Boat and used it for conducting small commando raids along the European coast. In United States service, the boat first saw action against the Japanese during the 1942 Battle of Guadalcanal. While it retains the superior handling and beaching ability of the Eureka boat, in combat the LCPL proved awkward to operate as troops could only disembark by jumping over the sides of the boat. However, Higgins was soon approached by Marine Lieutenant Victor Krulak, who in 1932 had observed Japanese forces using the Ramp Bo Dahatsu class landing craft in Shanghai. After being shown a photo of the Japanese craft by Krulak, Higgins began developing a ramped version of the LCPL, once again entirely at his own expense. The final design, known as the Landing Craft Vehicle, or LCV, was tested on Lake Ponchart Train on May 26, 1941. While initially it was planned to use the LCPL for troops and the LCV for small vehicles like Jeeps, it was soon recognized that both tasks could be performed by the same vessel. The LCV was thus modified and redesignated the Landing Craft Personnel Ramped, or LCPR. This was later changed to Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel, or LCVP, what would eventually become the iconic iconic Higgins boat. 11 meters long and powered by a 225 horsepower diesel engine, the LCVP had a maximum speed of 12 knots and could carry one 2,700 kilogram vessel, 3,700 kilograms of cargo, or 36 fully equipped troops. In combat, it was typically manned by a crew of four, the coxswain to steer, an engineer to maintain the engine, and a bowman and sternman to operate the ramp and anchors, and man the boat's twin 30 caliber machine guns. LCVPs were carried aboard larger troop ships to just off the landing beaches, then lowered into the water using davits. They could either be lowered fully loaded or be loaded once in the water, with troops clambering down onto the craft via nets slung over the side of the troop ship. To save on weight, construction time, and the use of strategic materials, LCVPs were mainly built of wood and had minimal armor, though the steel bow ramp did provide some protection. However, the craft's primary defense was its shallow draft and speed, which allowed it to cross the distance between the troop ship and the beach, deliver its cargo, and return to the troop ship before it could be targeted by the enemy. As the planned Allied invasions of North Africa, the Pacific Islands, and continental Europe would require thousands of landing craft, Andrew Higgins set about greatly expanding his production facilities. He was aided in his endeavor by a welcome injection of capital from Finland, which had paid Higgins Industries a half a million dollars to build torpedo boats. However, the U.S. government refused to allow their delivery on the minor grounds that Finland was aligned with Nazi Germany. Higgins thus sold the torpedo boats to the British and kept the finished payments, allowing him to build a massive new production facility at City Park in New Orleans. The largest covered boat building facility in the world at the time, the factory was also among the first to use Henry Ford style mass production production techniques. From here, the operation would grow at an astonishing rate. In 1938, Higgins Industries was a tiny company with only 75 employees and $13,000 in assets. By 1943, the company's seven factories employed more than 20,000 people and were worth more to the Louisiana economy than the state's traditional staple crops of rice and sugar combined. A forceful, belligerent personality and a born problem solver, Andrew Higgins used every trick in the book to keep Higgins' boat production running at full steam, from using dummy engines made of pipes to keep the assembly lines moving until the real engines arrived, to stealing materials from government warehouses, to hanging banners over the production floor that read, the guy who relaxes is helping the axis.
Such tactics did not endear Higgins to the military establishment, with columnist Drew Pearson writing, Higgins is very disagreeable, likes to write insulting letters to admirals, gets on almost everyone's nerves, but he is a genius when it comes to small boat design. Of the politics that inevitably came with fulfilling government contracts, Higgins had this to say, quote, I don't give a tinker's god damn except to do something to help win this war. I am no politician. I am awfully busy with companies and plants that I build at my own expense with such money that I had or could borrow or go in debt for. Yet for all his faults, Higgins was remarkably ahead of his time. His were the first fully integrated factories in New Orleans, employing undrafted white men, blacks, women, the elderly, and people with disabilities, all paid equal wages according to their job rating. It was a policy which was to win Higgins many enemies in the segregationist South. He also paid higher wages than most other American factories, stating in an interview, I am paying the highest schedule of wages in the United States. Every time I raise wages, the cost of the finished article goes down because I have a bunch of men working for me who are Americans. In return, Higgins expected nothing less than total devotion to efficient productions, and his workforce delivered. By 1943, production of Higgins' boats had reached an astonishing 54 per day, prompting Raymond Moley advisor to President Franklin D. Roosevelt to declare, Higgins' assembly line for small boats broke precedence. But it is Higgins himself who takes your breath away as much as his remarkable products and his fantastic ability to multiply his products at headlong speed. Higgins is an authentic master builder, with the kind of willpower, brains, drive, and daring that characterized the American Empire builders of an earlier generation. Such breakneck production, however, threatened to overwhelm the Navy's inspection process. Indeed, rather than inspecting the boats individually, inspectors soon began taking out small flotillas of four to five boats at the same time. To further improve efficiency, Higgins also ran 10-day courses to teach Navy coxswains how to properly handle his boat. On July 23, 1944, a celebration was held on Lake Pontchartrain to mark the delivery of the 10,000th Higgins boat to the U.S. Navy. By the end of the war, 20,094 of the sturdy little vessels would be built, 92% of the U.S. Navy's entire wartime fleet. In addition to LCBPs, Higgins Industries also created the larger landing craft mechanized or LCM, the first prototype of which Higgins designed, built, and launched in only three days. In total, the company produced 60 different boats for the U.S. war effort, including torpedo boats, engines, and airdropped lifeboats. Meanwhile, Higgins' most famous creation was proving itself invaluable on the battlefield. Used in nearly every theater of operations from North Africa to Italy, France, and the Pacific Islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa, the LCVP, then other ramped landing craft, forever changed the face of amphibious warfare. Whereas invading armies had previously been forced to capture a working port, allowing the enemy to concentrate their defenses on a few key targets, the Allies were now free to land along a much wider beachhead, forcing the enemy to spread their defenses more thinly. Men, vehicles, and supplies could then be efficiently transported directly onto the beach, allowing a concerted assault to be sustained. In the case of the D-Day landings in June 1944, this ability gave the Allies enough time to construct prefabricated floating harbors, codenamed Mulberry, which allowed cargo to be offloaded directly from transport ships until a proper port could be captured. This logistical feat allowed the Allies to sustain their drive from the beaches of Normandy right to the gates of Berlin. Though perhaps not as beautiful as some classic war machines like the Supermarine Spitfire or the P-51 Mustang fighters, like the Jeep, the Russian T-34 tank, and the Liberty ship, the Higgins boat nonetheless has a certain utilitarian elegance to it. It's a simple, rugged machine that did what it was designed to do and did it well. Indeed, such was the craft's logistical impact on the final Allied victory that in a 1964 interview with historian Stephen Ambrose, Allied Supreme Commander and late United States President Dwight D. Eisenhower declared, if Higgins had not designed and built those LCVPs, we never could have landed on an open beach. The whole strategy of the war would have been different. He is the man who won the war for us. But perhaps more astonishing than Higgins' boat design and production numbers is that this game-changing vehicle owed its entire existence not to some Navy design request or government planning committee, but to the genius, vision, and sheer bull-headed determination of a single man, Andrew Higgins. The Enterprise was conceived built and operated entirely on Higgins' own initiative and at his own expense, with the company receiving no government funds outside the agreed-upon price of each boat. As Joshua Schick, a curator at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, stated in a 2019 interview, his genius was problem-solving. Higgins applied it to everything in his life. Politics, dealing with unions, acquiring workers, producing fantastical things, or huge amounts of things. That was his essence.
But while the Second World War made his name and saw his company grow into one of the largest employers in Louisiana, peacetime was less kind to Andrew Higgins. After the war, Higgins attempted to diversify into other products such as tent trailers, luxury pleasure boats, construction materials, a shipping line to South America, and even helicopters. However, while many of these products might have sold well in the more affluent 50s, in 1947 they were ahead of their time and Higgins Industries faced financial difficulties and labor unrest. That same year, a hurricane inflicted millions of dollars of damage on Higgins' facilities, causing the company to hemorrhage Money. The Korean War brought more government orders for Higgins boats and other small craft, but by this time, Andrew Higgins was dead, having succumbed to stomach cancer on the 1st of August 1952, just a month shy of his 66th birthday. In 1959, Higgins Industries, one of the most successful companies in the United States, filed for bankruptcy and finally closed its doors. Two years later, its last remaining factory was converted by the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration into the Michord Assembly Facility, which was used to construct the giant Saturn V rockets for the Apollo Lunar Program and is still used today to produce large pieces of space hardware, like modules of the International Space Station and the new Space Launch System, or SLS. By the winter of 1944 and 1945, the German Third Reich was in dire straits. Adolf Hitler's final offensive in the Ardennes had failed. The Soviet Red Army was driving ever closer to Germany's borders, and day and night, Allied bomber aircraft were pummeling German cities into smoking rubble. With the ends in sight, the Nazi government hastily assembled a desperate last-ditch force to fight the final battle for the fatherland, the Volkssturm, a citizen's militia comprised of young boys and old men. Poorly trained and armed with motley assortment of leftover weapons, Vol Volkstrand units were derisively nicknamed casseroles by the regular army, as if they were full of old meat and green vegetables. A little more than cannon fodder against the better armed and trained Allied forces, the Volkssturm was emblematic of the suicidal fanaticism that typified the dying days of the Third Reich. But the madness went even further, for the youth of Germany were not only expected to face off against Russian tanks on the streets of Berlin, but shoot down waves of American bombers using crude wooden fighter jets. This is the story of the Heinkel HE-162 Volksjager, Nazi Germany's last-ditch fighter designed to be flown by children. As the Allied bombing offensive over Germany intensified throughout 1943 and 1945, Nazi planners turned to a series of increasingly sophisticated wonder weapons in a desperate attempt to stem the tide. These weapons included guided surface-to-air missiles like the Messerschmitt Enzian and Henschel Schmetterling, jet fighters like the Messerschmitt Me-262 Schwalbe, and rocket fighters like the Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet. However, not only were these weapons resource-intensive to produce in the large quantities needed, but most could only be flown by experience experienced pilot, something that Germany had in short supply. So, on September 10, 1944, the Reich Air Ministry, or RLM, put out a call for the development of a lightweight emergency fighter. According to the RLM specifications, the aircraft had to be powered by a single BMW 003 turbojet engine, weigh under two metric tons, use a minimum of strategic materials like steel and aluminium, and be easy to mass produce. Minimum performance was set at 750 kilometers per hour, or 466 miles per hour, top speed with a takeoff roll of no more than 500 meters and a flight endurance of at least 30 minutes. Armament was to be two 20mm cannons with 100 rounds per gun or two 30mm cannons with 50 rounds per gun. Most crucially, however, the aircraft had to be easy to fly with minimal training, allowing members of the Hitler Youth to fly it into combat. Proposals were to be submitted no later than September the 20th and the winning entry ready to enter production by New Year's 1945. This ambitious and foolhardy program soon became known as the Volksjager, the People's Fighter. The Volksjager program was vehemently opposed by leading figures in the German Luftwaffe, including General Lieutenant Adolf Galland, who feared that it would divert resources from more promising aircraft like the ME-262. This view was also shared by many in the German aviation industry, such as engineers Willy Messerschmitt and Kurt Tank. However, since the project had the support of Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering and a Minister of Armaments Albert Speer, both high-ranking figures in the Nazi government, these objections were ignored. Nearly every aircraft manufacturer in Germany submitted a proposal for the Volksjager program, but only two made RLM's shortlist. Blom and Voss and Heinkel. Blom and Voss's proposal, the P211, was remarkably advanced for its time, with a fuselage-mounted engine reminiscent of post-war jet fighters like the American F-86 Sabre and the Soviet MiG-21. The initial design even included swept-back wings for extra speed, though for ease of production, these were soon changed to simpler straight wings. Unfortunately for Blom and Voss, however, Heinkel had already been working on a lightweight fighter for some time. In July 1944, Siegfried Gunther, head of Heinkel's project office, issued a report to his senior managers, some 
summarizing the state of German air forces and the ideal design requirements for fighter aircraft going forward. In addition to numerical ratios, the attainment air superiority also depends on flight performance. If enemy jet single-seaters are encountered, the superiority of the ME-262 cannot be relied upon due to its conventional design with unswept wings and the arrangement of the motor near the ground, which makes fuel consumption high and the range short. For this reason, it is necessary to limit yourself to a single-seater aircraft with the least possible equipment and the largest proportion of fuel in the total weight. The aircraft design became known as the P-1073 Stahljager, and it was calculated to have a maximum speed of 1,010 km per hour and a maximum range of 1,000 km using Heinkel's own HES-11 turbojet. But when the RLM issued its Volksjager specifications on September the 10th, Heinkel quickly adopted the P-1073 design to use the specified BMW 003 engine and submitted it to the competition the following day. Thanks to this head start, as well as a measure of political lobbying, Heinkel ultimately won the competition and signed a contract with RLM to deliver a thousand Volksjagers by April of 1945 and 2000 by May. The design was officially designated the HE-162 Spatz, or Sparrow, though many sources incorrectly refer to the aircraft as the Salamander, actually a code name for its wing structure. Designed by Siegfried Gunther and Karl Schwalzler, the HE-162 was a radical-looking aircraft. Its single-jet engine was mounted in a streamlined pod above the fuselage, with the intake just above and behind the pilot's head. This, along with the aircraft's short tricycle landing gear, was intended to provide easy access to the engine for maintenance, a useful feature since the service life of early jet engines was measured in hours. While the fuselage was made of metal to conserve strategic materials, the short wings and tail, chosen to clear the engine exhaust, were built of laminated wood. Further, as bailing out conventionally was likely to result in the pilot being sucked into the engine intake, the HE-162 was among the first combat aircraft to be fitted with an ejection seat, which launched the pilot clear of the cockpit using a small explosive cartridge. Two versions of the aircraft were initially planned. The HE-162A1 bomber destroyer armed with two 30mm MK-108 cannons and the HE-162A2 air superiority fighter armed with two 20mm MG-151s. That said, the recoil of the MK-108s proved too powerful for the tiny airframe, so ultimately the MG-151s were used instead. Heinkel also came up with a number of follow-up models, including the HE-162A3 with a strengthened nose to take the recoil of the MK-108s. The HE-162 163B1 with a more powerful engine and greater endurance, the HE-162S tandem seat glider for training Hitler youth pilots, and a number of variants powered by simpler and cheaper pulse jet engines. However, due to lack of time and resources, only the basic A1 model was ever mass-produced. Incredibly, just 74 days passed between Heinkel accepting the RLM contract on September the 23rd and the HE-162 prototype's test flight on December the 6th. This took place at Schwechat Airfield near Vienna, with Heinkel test pilot Gotthold Peter at the controls. At first, all went well, until 20 minutes into the flight, a landing gear door fell off, forcing Peter to land immediately. The failure was soon traced to a faulty glue bond, a problem that would plague the aircraft throughout its short career. Nonetheless, the test was deemed a success, with the HE-162 reaching an impressive top speed of 840 km per hour, 520 miles per hour, at an altitude of 6,000 meters or about 20,000 feet. However, it quickly became apparent that the Nazi government's plans to crew the Volksjager with Hitler Youth was a fanatical pipe dream. While extremely fast and highly maneuverable, the HE-162 proved tricky even for an experienced pilot like Peter to handle, exhibiting significant lateral instability. And even bigger problems appeared four days later, as Got old Peter took to the air to demonstrate the HE-162 before Nazi Party officials. While making a high-speed pass over the airfield, the wing came partly unglued and shed an aerolon, sending the aircraft crashing to the ground and killing Peter instantly. Despite this setback, production of the HE-162 carried on as planned. Indeed, such was the Nazis' desperation to get the Volksjager into combat as soon as possible that mass production began even before the first prototype had flown, with modifications derived from the flight testing program being applied directly on the assembly line. Among these were the strengthening of the wing structure and the addition of turned-down wingtips to correct some of the aircraft's lateral stability problems. While the first 31 HE-162s were produced at the Heinkel plant in Vienna, the ongoing Allied bombing campaign forced Heinkel to disperse production of components to small shops and factories all over Germany. Final assembly took place at the Heinkel plant in Merahenja, the Junkers plant at Bernberg, and the underground Mittelwerk factory at Nordhausen in the Haas Mountains. Here, the aircraft were assembled by forced laborers from the Mittelbau Dora concentration camp under the brutal watch of the SS. Incidentally, Mittelwerk also assembled the infamous V-2 ballistic missile, 3,000 of which 
which would rain down on England and Belgium between September 1944 and March 1945, killing over 9,000 people. So this brings us to February of 1945, when the Luftwaffe formed a Probungskommando 162, an evaluation unit commanded by Ober's Lieutenant Heinz Barr, an experienced fighter pilot with 200 confirmed kills. Based at Reichland Airfield in southern Germany, the unit received the first batch of 46 HE-162s and spent the next two months familiarizing themselves with the aircraft's handling characteristics. Meanwhile, the first operation unit, HE-162 unit, Jag Destrader 1, was formed at Parshim, near the Heinkel factory at Mariena. However, as preliminary flight testing had indicated, the HE-162 proved tricky to fly, especially on takeoff and landing, leading to many accidents. As pilot Harold Bauer later recalled, When we started out in February and March, it was a very tough, cold winter at the time, and they had plowed runways with ice banks forming at the sides. During my short period at Heinkel Works from December 44 to March 45, we started out with 65 people, and when I took off on my last flight, there were five left of the original group. None of them died in combat, all of them died either by breaking out on landing or breaking out on takeoff, hitting the ice on either side of the runway. And then a sweeper truck came in and swept the remains into a big hole. Things didn't exactly improve when on April the 7th, 1945, just as JG-1 was approaching combat readiness, Partrim Airfield was bombed by American B-17 Flying Fortress aircraft, forcing the unit to move to nearby Ludwigslust airfield. A week later, they moved again to Lech in Schleswig-Holstein, near the Danish border, where the HE-162 finally saw combat for the first time. On April 19th, the type scored its first victory when an HE-162 of JG-1 shot down a British Hawker Tempest fighter. However, the German pilot was soon shot down himself by another Tempest while returning to base. The following day, another HE-162 pilot performed one of the first successful combat ejections in history. While his reason for bailing out is not recorded, given the HE-162's half-hour endurance, it's likely that he simply ran out of fuel. Indeed, while HE-162 pilots managed to score a handful of victories before the end of the war, this came at the cost of 13 aircraft and 10 pilots, most being lost to landing or takeoff accidents and engine failures. Fast forward to early May, shortly after Adolf Hitler managed to take out Hitler in Berlin, a Pro Bungs Commando 162 was formed into an operational unit under the command of Adolf Galland. But this was too little too late. For a week later, Germany surrendered, and Galland's men burned their aircraft to prevent them falling into enemy hands. Other units, however, gladly handed over their mounts, giving Allied pilots and engineers examples so they could evaluate the strange little jet. Thankfully, the Nazi Party's mad scheme to send swarms of Hitler Youth pilots against the might of the Allied Air Force this never came to pass. World War II saw the nations of the world investing massive amounts of manpower and money into the development of better ways to extinguish life in the hopes of turning the tide of the war in their respective favors. Sometimes including coming up with outlandish contraptions like surprisingly effective bat bombs and pigeon-guided missiles, as well as anti-tank dogs, flying jeeps and tanks, suicide torpedoes, super ships made of ice, and even balloon bombs randomly sent out with the hope they might land somewhere thousands of miles away on enemy soil. Today, we'll be looking at another notable World War II weapon, the V-3 cannon, a piece of artillery capable of hitting a target more than 100 miles away, shooting its projectiles around 3,400 miles per hour, that's 5,500 kilometers an hour. Technically, this is defined as a supergun, a term given to guns of such comically large size that they need to be categorized separately. The V3 was 430 feet long, 131 meters. This massive size meant that the gun had to be built already aiming at its target and could only reliably hit a target the size of a city, a fairly minor trade-off considering the weapon's nigh unparalleled range for a non-rocket-based weapon. The V3 was able to achieve the incredible projectile range due to a rather unique firing mechanism that utilized multiple smaller explosions rather than one big one along the length of its barrel that was set to go off just as the projectile passed these side chambers. This allowed the supergun to fire its payload at extreme distances without damaging the barrel, which had proved to be a problem for other similarly massive guns. Notable here, for reasons we'll get to in a minute, is the so-called Kaiser Wilhelm Geschätz, quite literally Emperor Wilhelm gun. This was a 200-ton, 111-foot gun that was used by the Germans to shell Paris during World War I. It could only fire around 60 rounds before its entire barrel needed to be replaced due to damage from the explosions used to launch its 106 kilo or 236-pound shells. The projectiles also had to be numbered and fired in a specific 
specific order, with each one slightly bigger than the previous one to account for the increasing diameter of the barrel as the massive cannon was fired each time. The Emperor gun was so powerful it was noted for being the first man-made invention to launch an object into the stratosphere, with the shells it launched peaking at an altitude of around 40 kilometers during flight. The range of the gun was so unthinkably extreme for such a weapon that the 80-man team in charge of firing it had to aim a little under a kilometer to the left of the target to account for the Coriolis effect. The French military genuinely suspected for a time that these projectiles were being launched from super-high zeppelins hiding behind clouds because the idea of them being fired from a gun up to 75 miles 120 kilometers away, was deemed to be far too absurd. Virtually all records of this gun's existence and how it was constructed were destroyed towards the close of World War I. Nonetheless, it was known to the French, and in response they drafted plans for an even bigger gun that utilized multiple explosions to launch projectiles a similar distance. Sounding familiar? Well, these plans were ultimately archived by the French after World War I and were found by German soldiers in 1940, who then passed them on to August Condes, the guy who designed the V3 cannon. In other words, the only reason the V3 cannon was even invented is because the Germans found plans at the start of World War II explicitly drafted to counter another giant gun they'd used during World War I. In any event, beyond its massive range, a battery of V3 cannons could fire close to 300 shells an hour, or roughly one every 12 seconds. This is a fact that piqued the interest of Hitler himself, who enthusiastically granted the project near-unlimited support when existence of a prototype was brought to his attention in 1943 by his advisor Albert Speer, even though said prototype had yet to fire a single shell. With Hitler throwing everything the German military had at its disposal behind the project in mid-1943, the V3 cannon, dubbed the High Pressure Pump during construction to hide its purpose from spies, went from the idea phase to construction almost immediately. Since Hitler wanted to use the gun to shell London, and the gun had to be built aiming at its target, the location had to be somewhere in northern France. The gun also needed to be built within close proximity to a railway due to the size of its ammunition, which could only be transported effectively via rail. Luckily for the Nazis, an ideal location was found in the form of a limestone hill located in a French hamlet in northern France. The location was deemed ideal, as the chalk that made up most of the hill would be easy to excavate, but was ultimately strong enough to tunnel through to create the underground infrastructure needed for the weapon. Construction of 50 V3 guns began in earnest in September of 1943, utilizing a combination of drafted German engineers and Soviet POWs. The initial plan was for two separate facilities to be constructed roughly a kilometer apart, each housing 25 V3 cannons built into drifts dug in the hillside. They also planned to build tunnels connecting each facility that would be used for storing the shells, which in turn would be transported to the guns via an underground railway. Amazingly, construction of most of the underground tunnels was completed. However, construction of the guns themselves was severely hampered when the Allies learned of a German plan to attack London using an unknown superweapon in the later stages of 1943. Knowing that the Germans were planning something in the hamlet and putting two into together, the RAF doggedly attacked it throughout the last few months of 1943 and during the first half of 1944. This led to the proposed number of V3 cannons dropping from 50 to 25 when the RAF destroyed the most western site. This was further reduced to five following a bombing run utilizing tallboy bombs specifically designed to destroy fortified bunkers on July 6, 1944. Plans were dropped altogether on July 30 of that same year due to the advance of Allied ground troops. The Allies wouldn't actually learn about the existence of the V3 cannons until after the war, at which point then Prime Minister Winston Churchill was reported as saying that the site could have been responsible for the most devastating attack of all on London. Although the Nazis never got a full-size V3 cannon working during World War II, they did manage to construct two smaller versions of the weapon with which they shelled the recently liberated Luxembourg from a somewhat less impressive distance of 43 kilometers or 26 miles away in late 1944. 
Smaller but still impressively powered, these Mini V3s were capable of shooting off their deadly projectiles at speeds of over 2,000 miles per hour or 3,300 kilometers an hour. Despite the impressive specs and with the guns firing hundreds of rounds, 142 of which hit Luxembourg, only 10 people were killed and 35 were wounded as a result. While the Nazis tried desperately to use the gun again, even deploying one during their last major offensive of World War II, Operation Nordwind, they never actually actually successfully fired another version of the V3 again during the entire war, giving these guns a laughably low kill rate given the resources that were put into them. Today, the failed location of the French battery has been converted into a museum containing what remains of the guns. In the pantheon of iconic aircraft, perhaps none is more revered than the Supermarine Spitfire. Considered one of the most beautiful fighters ever designed, along with its stablemate, the Hawker Hurricane, the Spitfire has become emblematic of Britain's determined resistance against Nazi Germany in the early days of the Second World War. Yet despite its legendary reputation, the Spitfire was far from a perfect machine. Its narrow landing gear made landings precarious, its widely spaced wing-mounted guns reduced its concentration of firepower, and at higher speeds its elegant elliptical wings had a tendency of flexing, often leading to fatal crashes. But the Spitfire's greatest Achilles heel lay in a component almost as celebrated as the aircraft itself, its Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Whenever the Spitfire executed a negative G maneuver, such as entering a dive or flying inverted, the engine would suddenly lose power, cut out, or stall altogether, a potentially lethal occurrence in a dogfight. Indeed, German fighter pilots quickly learned to exploit this weakness, and when attacked by British fighters, would suddenly pitch down, causing the pursuing Spitfire or Hurricane to lose power and giving the German pilot enough time to escape or come up from behind. The issue lay with the Merlin's SU Carburetto, which was a standard float type originally developed for automobile engines. Carburetors regulate the mixture of fuel and air reaching the engine. In the SU type, a piston exposed on one side of the air inlet manifold is linked to a jet and a needle valve connected to the fuel supply system. When the throttle is opened, more air is drawn into the engine and the air velocity in the manifold manifold increases. This, in turn, lowers the pressure in the manifold, drawing the piston down and opening the needle valve, allowing more fuel to enter the airstream. The fuel supply is thus matched to the engine's demand for air. Before reaching the jet and needle valve, the fuel first passes through a float chamber, in which a float linked to an inlet valve keeps the fuel at a constant level and thus a constant pressure. While this works perfectly well in an automobile or civil aircraft, which stays more or less level, exposure to negative Gs causes the float tank to flood and deliver an overly rich fuel-air mixture to the engine, decreasing its power. The Spitfire's opponents, the Messerschmitt BF-109, did not suffer from this fault as its Daimler-Benz DB605 engine was fuel-injected. With Britain fighting for its life, the race was on to find a solution. Rolls-Royce attempted to develop an improved carburetor, but Fighter Command could not afford to send any of its aircraft or their engines back to the factory to be modified. In the end, a solution was found by one Beatrice Schilling, an engineer working at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Miss Schilling's fix was simplicity itself, a small, thimble-shaped flow restrictor fitted to the float tank inlet valve, which allowed just enough fuel to flow through it to supply the engine at full power, while also preventing the float tank from flooding under negative Gs. And as a bonus, it could quickly be fitted to aircrafts in the field. Simplified to a plain steel washer, the restrictor was quickly fitted to all of Fighter Command's aircraft by RAE teams, often led by Miss Schilling herself. While officially known as the RAE restrictor, the Appreciative RAF pilots soon dubbed the device Miss Schilling's Orifice. While countless factors contributed to Britain's victory against the Luftwaffe in the summer of 1940, Miss Schilling's elegant solution to the Merlin's cutoff problem doubtless played a significant role by allowing the Spitfire to tango toe to toe with the BF 109. Of course, Miss Schilling's orifice was only ever intended as a stopgap solution, and eventually all Merlin-equipped fighters were fitted with new Bendix pressure carburetors, which did not rely on gravity to operate. As for Beatrice Schilling, she would go on to a long, productive career at the RAE, working on such projects as the Blue Streak ballistic missile and measuring aircraft braking distances on wet runways until retiring in 1969 at the age of 60. Her personal life was no less eventful. An avid motorcycle racer in the 1930s, she 
set numerous records with her modified Norton M30, coming only one of three women to win the British Motorcycle Racing Club's Gold Star for completing the lap of Brooklyn's racing circuit at 160 km an hour. Indeed, it is sometimes reported that she refused to marry her husband, bomber pilot George Naylor, until he himself accomplished the same feat. After the war, she raced cars at Goodwood Circuit until shortly before her retirement from the RAE. She died in 1990 at the age of 81. On a final note, many sources refer to Schilling by the nickname Tilly, but this moniker is unlikely to have ever been used in her presence. Tilly being military slang for a utility truck, the name was likely intended as a dig at Schilling's supposedly plain appearance, a cruel jab at a woman who did so much to save Britain in her darkest hour. And now for a bonus fact. A commonly touted fact on the interwebs is that one of the most beautiful women in Hollywood in the 1940s, none other than Hedy Lamarr herself, helped invent the wireless technology we all know and love today. But is this actually true? Well, not exactly, but the non-sensationalized facts of the matter are no less fascinating, involving Hollywood, the World War II Axis powers, remote control technology, and, yes, actress Hedy Lamarr. To begin with, Hedwig Eva Maria Keisler, better known as Hedy Lamarr, once really did patent a secret communication system meant to foil the Axis during World War II. It was designed specifically to be used as a remote control system to securely guide torpedoes while getting around the problem of jamming. Her idea at its core was really just part of a larger concept of frequency hopping, with her device developed with composer George Antheil. Long forgotten until relatively recently, when it was rediscovered by researchers in 1997, the methods used in her invention were far ahead of their time, with the principles behind it paving the way for wide-spectrum communication technology that we enjoy in Bluetooth and other wireless technologies today. More specifically, during World War II, the National Inventors Council was formed to recruit Americans to pitch in with ideas to foil the Axis powers. Technological inventions aimed at breaking encoded communications and encryption were especially sought. Lamar submitted an idea for a radio-controlled torpedo. As mentioned, Hedy's idea, in collaboration with the avant-garde musician George Anthony, who had previously experimented with automated control of musical instruments used frequency hopping, wherein transmitter and receiver communicated via a channel that constantly changed frequencies, making it difficult to detect and jam. The idea of the torpedo communication system was to utilize a piano roll like punch tape to create signals within 88 different frequencies, emulating the keys of a piano of the radio spectrum in a sequence shared only by the torpedo's receiver and the transmitter on the ship. As laid out in her and Anthea George's patent, US229-2387, briefly, our system as adopted for radio control of a remote craft employs a pair of synchronous records, one at the transmitting station and one at the receiving station, which change the tuning of the transmitting and receiving apparatus from time to time, so that without knowledge of the records, an enemy would be unable to determine at what frequency a controlling impulse would be sent. In our system, such a record would permit the use of 88 different carrier frequencies, from one to another, of which both the transmitting and receiving station would be changed at intervals. Furthermore, records of the type described can be made of substantial length and may be driven slow or fast. This makes it possible for a pair of records, one at the transmitting station and one at the receiving station, to run for a length of time ample for the remote control of a device such as a torpedo. The two records may be synchronized by driving them with accurately calibrated constant speed spring motors, such as are implied for driving clocks and chronometers. However, it is also within the scope of our invention to periodically correct the position of the record at the receiving station by transmitting synchronous impulses from the transmitting station. By thus rapidly hopping from one frequency to the next, the enemy monitoring the radio waves had no hope to intercept and jam the signal, allowing the torpedo to continue to be controlled throughout its journey towards an enemy ship. Previous to this, a problem existed in that the guidance signal could be detected and jammed, allowing the enemy ship to simply move out of the way of the previously remotely controlled torpedo. Lamar and George presented this technology to the National Inventors Council in 1940, but wouldn't you know it, the military brass chose to ignore the brilliant idea from the beautiful actress and the avant-garde experimental composer, even though it would have proved extremely useful and quite practical using existing technologies of the day, rather than needing expensive new technologies to be developed to make it work. Her design for a secret communication system using frequency hopping was patented, filed, and forgotten for a time, though later the US military would use the 
same idea during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And of course, today this same idea is used all over the place in various wireless technologies. Eventually, Lamar was given credit for her idea in 1997 when the Electronic Frontier Foundation awarded her with a Pioneer Award, and she also received the prestigious Bronze Balby NAS Lifetime Achievement Award given to outstanding individuals whose lifetime achievements in the arts, sciences, business, or invention fields significantly contributed to society. Incidentally, she was the first woman to win that latter Academy Award of Inventors. One year later, in 1998, Wyland Inc. purchased a 49% stake in Lamar's patent in exchange for some undisclosed amount of company stock, which, despite our sincerest efforts, we were unable to find how much she got from the swap. Now, at this point, you might be wondering where the actress got the idea and munitions expertise to create such a thing. Hedy Lamar was born in 1913 in Vienna. Her movie debut at the age of 18 was Gustav Marti's Ecstasy, a 1931 film which is notorious even today for its nudity and a very convincing female orgasm scene. Shortly after making that film, she attempted to free herself of a domineering husband, Friedrich Mandel, who was a wealthy Austrian munitions dealer she had married at the age of 19. Like a fabled princess, she was all but captive in her castle home in Austria. Hedy's husband presided over numerous meetings with leaders of the military industry, and despite both he and his wife having Jewish ancestry, hobnobbed at dinner parties with the likes of Hitler and Mussolini. Partially as he liked to keep an eye on her, she often accompanied her husband to many conferences and business meetings with various engineers and scientists who specialized in weaponry. It is during this period that Hedy is thought to have augmented her skill with mathematics with valuable information about weapon systems, particularly being privy to technologies her husband's company and others were trying to develop to use to detect and jam communication systems used by enemy military powers. To escape her oppressive and ultra-controlling husband, along with her virtual prison in his castle, according to her autobiography, Ecstasy and Me, in 1937, she drugged a maid that looked something like her, then disguised herself as the maid and managed to leave the castle and flee the country under her stolen identity. Her Hollywood career was launched before she even arrived in the United States when she met MGM mogul Louis B. Meyer in Europe. At that time, he convinced her to change her name to Hedy Lamar with the Lamar in homage to the famed silent film star Barbara Lamar in order to distance herself from the ecstasy stigma that had followed her since the film. She soon had a distinguished career playing alongside a who's who of great actors such as Clark Gable and Spencer Tracy. As noted, in the end, Hedy's unrealized contribution to World War II and wireless technology lay dormant for many years. She didn't invent wireless itself, as you'll often read, but she did patent an idea with huge potential. The technology in her secret communication system patent was broad enough to have wide application, and its brilliant use of frequency hopping at its core is essential to many wireless technologies we have today. So technically, the industry couldn't proceed without applying this idea of hers in certain technologies which first occurred in the public sector in the late 1950s when Code Division Multiple Access CDMA, was being developed and her invention was rediscovered during a patent search. Of all of the advanced weapons technology developed by Nazi Germany during the Second World War, perhaps none was as sought after by the Allies as the Aggregate 4 rocket, better known as the V-2. Developed at the Penamunda Army Research Station under the director of Walter Dornberger and Werner von Braun, the V-2 was the world's first operational ballistic missile, pioneering many of the technologies that would later become standard in most modern rockets, such as turbine fuel pumps, gyroscopic stabilization, and radio guidance systems. Standing 14 meters tall and weighing 12.5 tons, the V-2 had a range of 320 kilometers and could be set up and fired in a few hours by highly mobile launching squads making it difficult for Allied aircraft to track down and destroy. And once fired, it was unstoppable, rising to the edge of space before hurtling down at its target at nearly 3,000 km per hour, nearly twice the speed of sound. Between September 1944 and March 1945, around 3,225 V-2s were fired at targets in England and mainland Europe, killing an estimated 2,754 civilians. But while the V-2 was a technological marvel and a potent propaganda symbol, as a strategic weapon, it was a dismal failure. Despite its incredible sophistication, the V-2 could only carry a one-ton explosive warhead and was so inaccurate it could only be used against city-sized targets. This, combined with the rocket's tendency to break apart before even reaching its target, meant that its impact on the war was minimal, all while costing Germany the equivalent of 40 billion US dollars, more than half as much as the Manhattan Project and consuming valuable resources desperately needed elsewhere for the war effort. 
Furthermore, the rockets were produced by slave laborers in unimaginably brutal conditions, an estimated 26,500 of whom died in the process. This makes the V-2 the only weapon in history to kill more people in its manufacture than in combat. But while the V-2 may not have been the war-winning weapon Germany had hoped for, the Allies immediately recognized it as a weapon of the future, and even before the war in Europe had ended, the mad scramble for German rocket technology began. Infamously, the majority of the German rocket scientists defected to the Americans, who sanitized their Nazi past and brought them to the United States as part of Operation Paperclip. In addition to helping the United States develop missile technology, many of these scientists would form the backbone of America's fledgling space program and help land men on the moon. The Soviets also captured a number of scientists, as well as the development center and the underground V-2 factory at Nordhausen, while Britain and France captured and studied large numbers of V-2 rocket parts. But often forgotten in this race for German technology is Canada, which, although still technically part of the British Empire, had been granted nominal independence in 1931 and was keen to operate militarily on its own terms. So in May 1945, Canada formed the first Canadian Army Army Museum collection team, a crack five-man squad tasked with scouring Germany for weapons to bring back to Canada. Leading the squad was 24-year-old Captain Farley Moat, who would later go on to become a beloved environmentalist and author of such classic books as Never Cry Wolf and People of the Deer. Over the next three months, Moat's team collected over 700 tons of German military equipment, ranging from tanks to aircraft to artillery pieces, and even midget submarines. Then in July 1945, the team stumbled upon the ultimate prize. While speaking to local members of the Dutch resistance, Moat learns of a trainload of V-2 rockets which had escaped Allied bombing sitting on a railroad siding just west of Nienberg in Germany. The train was being guarded by a detachment of British troops whose commanders had forbidden Canadians and other colonials from acquiring German rocket technology. But determined to bring back a V-2 for Canada, Moat dispatched Canadian Intelligence Corps Lieutenant Mike Donovan on a daring heist mission. Setting out in a jeep from the team's base in Oudekerk in the Netherlands, Donovan surveyed the site and discovered that the last V2 in the train was partially concealed by some trees and was accessible by a small road running through the forest. Donovan returned to base and, along with Lieutenant Jim Hood, acquired a 12-ton tow truck, work crew, and a trailer for a midget submarine before heading back to the V-2 site. While Lieutenant Hood concealed the truck in the forest around two miles from the rocket, Donovan approached the British guards, bearing a demijohn of Dutch gin, and offered them all a drink. Within hours, the entire contingent had been rendered blackout drunk, and as dusk fell, Donovan told his drinking partners that he had to relieve himself. Instead, he used a radio in his jeep to signal the all-clear to Hood, who along with his work crew, drove his truck up to the last rail car, cut the tie-down chains, and managed to roll the 4.5-ton rocket onto the submarine trailer and spirit it away back to Oudekerk. Fearing that the British or Americans would try to confiscate his valuable prize, Captain Moat ordered that the rocket be camouflaged. It was thus fitted with a false wooden conning tower, periscope, and propeller, and given a coat of navy blue paint in order to pass it off as an experiment or midget submarine. In this guise, the rocket successfully avoided detection until it was finally loaded aboard the transport ship. On arrival in Canada, the V-2 was sent to the Canadian Armament Research and Development Establishment, or CARD, in Valcartier, Quebec. Here, it was carefully disassembled, examined, and blueprinted. During this process, it was discovered that the rocket had been armed the whole time, requiring the CARD scientists to carefully drill a hole in the nose and drain out one ton of high explosive. In the 1950s, the V-2 was prominently displayed at the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto, but after this, all record of the rocket's whereabouts seemed to disappear. The last reported sighting of the Canadian V-2 was in 1961 in the scrapyard of the Canadian Forces Base in Picton, Ontario in 1961. The base was closed in 1969, meaning that the rocket, which had taken such ingenuity and daring to acquire, was likely bulldozed into a landfill, never to be seen again. And despite having been able to examine such advanced technology early on, Canada never developed its own homegrown satellite launching rocket like the Americans, Soviets, British, and French did. When the first Canadian designed and built satellite Alouette 1 blasted into orbit on September 29, 1962, it was on board an American rocket. But the legacy of the V 2 lives on. Combined with the war's other great technological achievement, the atomic bomb, ballistic missile technology would form the cornerstone of the Cold War policy of mutually assured destruction and shape the course of history for the next 50 years.
Now for some bonus facts. The V2 was fueled by 5 tons of liquid oxygen and 4 tons of 75% ethyl alcohol, essentially 150 proof vodka. One strange consequence of this fuel combination was that in the closing days of the war, the V2 rocket consumed nearly all of Germany's supply of potatoes, further worsening already dire food shortages. The fuel also caused major problems for the rocket development program at Pennemund, as army and SS directors noticed that it tended to evaporate at a much faster rate than chemistry typically allowed. Yes, it turned out the German rocket scientists were helping themselves to the rocket fuel in order to get rip-roaring drunk, so much so that fuel theft is estimated to have delayed the entire project by several weeks. In response, the SS added bad-tasting pink dye to the fuel to render it undrinkable, but the ever-resourceful scientists soon discovered how to filter this out by passing the fuel through a potato. The SS countered by adding a purgative to render the drinker violently ill, but this too backfired, resulting in such high rates of absenteeism that it threatened to derail the entire project. Eventually, a solution was found in the form of methanol or wood alcohol, which is not only extremely toxic, but very difficult to filter or distill out of ethanol. After one of the scientists went blind and another died from methanol poisoning, the drinking problem suddenly stopped. And now for another bonus fact. In the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa, alongside many of the weapons and vehicles captured by Captain Moat and his team, sits a seemingly nondescript piece of equipment with a surprisingly fascinating history. This collection of cylindrical cans painted in blue and white camouflage is known as Weather Station Kurt, and it is all that remains of the only successful Nazi invasion of North America. The German U-boat campaign against Allied shipping in the Atlantic was dependent on accurate weather reports, and as weather systems in the Atlantic tend to move from the west to the east, it was necessary to collect meteorological data as close to the North American coast as possible to give adequate warning. At first, the Germans used weather ships and manned weather stations, but these were vulnerable to capture by Allied forces, and regular weather reporting by U-boats required them to break radio silence and expose themselves to attack. So, in 1943, German firm Siemens developed the Oetter Fungerat Land 26, an electronic automatic weather station that could automatically broadcast regular weather reports for up to six months. This system was housed in 10 steel canisters, two of which held the meteorological instruments and a radio antenna, and the other eight batteries to power the device. In total, 14 of these stations were deployed by U-boats in various Arctic regions such as Greenland, Spitsbergen, and Norway. Two were intended for the North American coast, but the U-boat carrying one of them, U-867, was sunk in September 1944. On October 22, 1943, U-537, commanded by Captain Lieutenant Peter Shrew, arrived at Martin Bay on the east coast of Labrador, approximately six degrees north of the Arctic Circle. After dropping anchor, Shrew sent technician Dr. Kurt Sommermeyer, after who the station was codenamed, and ten sailors ashore in order to install the weather equipment, while the rest of the crew worked through the night to repair storm damage to U-537. To prevent sailors and local Inuit from discovering and interfering with the equipment, it was marked as belonging to the non-existent Canadian media service, and empty American cigarette packets were scattered about the site. 28 hours after dropping anchor, U-537 departed Martin Bay, and resumed its war patrol. Weather station Kurt operated for a month before mysteriously going silent, and as the war came to an end in May 1945, it and its fellow stations were promptly forgotten. Then in 1977, while researching the history of the Siemens company, retired engineer Franz Selinger stumbled across the papers of Dr. Kurt Summermeyer, which included pictures of weather station Kurt. Intrigued, Selinger contacted W.A.B. Douglas, a historian at the Canadian Department of National Defense, asking if the station still existed. In 1981, Douglas sailed to Martin Bay, and to his surprise, discovered the remains of the station, rusty but mostly intact, exactly where Dr. Sommermeyer had left it more than 30 years before. Of all the major military conflicts of the 20th century, the Second World War stands apart. Not only was it the deadliest conflict in modern history, claiming an estimated 85 million lives, or about one in every 25 people, but it was also arguably history's first truly technological war. While many now ubiquitous military technologies, such as aircraft, tanks, and submarines, saw their combat debut in the First World War, it was during the Second that they were refined into truly effective weapons, along with other key innovations, such as radar, guided missiles, and nuclear weapons. One of the less glamorous, but nonetheless important developments of the war was the use of parachutes to rapidly deliver troops and equipment behind enemy lines, a technique that proved instrumental in dozens of operations from the German invasion of the Low Countries in 1940 to the Allied D-Day landings in 1944. But the parachutes at the time had their limitations. They could not be steered, and they delivered their payloads to the ground slowly, making them vulnerable to drifting off target and being damaged by anti-aircraft fire. In an attempt to solve this problem and make airborne delivery faster and more accurate, in 1944, the British Admiralty conducted a series of bizarre experiments to explore the use of retro 
rockets to slow the descent of falling payloads, eliminating the need for parachutes altogether. This is the story of Hajile, one of the Second World War's most intriguing and hilariously unsuccessful secret weapons. The Hajile project was undertaken by the British Admiralty's Directorate of Miscellaneous Weapons Development, or DMWD, founded in 1941 as an offshoot of the Inspectorate of Anti-Aircraft Weapons and Devices. In true cheeky British fashion, the name was soon corrupted to the instigator of anti-aircraft wheezes and dodges, creating the DMWD's enduring nickname of the Wheezes and Dodges. In any event, the DMWD was one of the many similar groups established by the British early in the war, leveraging the unique talents of a ragtag group of scientists, engineers, and other eccentric misfits to develop creative and often bizarre solutions to difficult wartime problems. Over its brief four-year history, the DMWD would employ a number of colorful characters, including motor racing photographer Louis Kamantaski, engineer Barnes Wallace, inventor of the bouncing bomb used in the famous 1943 Dam Busters raid, and engineer Neville Shute Norway, later to become famous as the author of novels like On the Beach and A Town Like Alice. Headed by Canadian chemist Charles Goodeye and headquartered at HMS Burnbeck, a converted pier at Western Supermare in Somerset, DMWD tackled all sorts of unconventional projects, including radar countermeasures and ship camouflage, amphibious assault techniques, anti-submarine weapons, and of course, Hijile. The concept behind Hijile was straightforward enough. Instead of a parachute, airdropped payloads were fitted with a set of downward-facing cordite solid-fuel rockets, which were fired just before impact, quickly slowing the payload and delivering it safely to the ground. This would allow the payload to free fall for most of its descent, allowing it to be more accurately dropped onto landing zones and protecting it from enemy fire. In practice, however, this scheme proved anything but simple to pull off. One of the key technical difficulties of the concept was how to reliably trigger the rockets at the exact right moment. Too late and the payload would either plow into the ground at terminal velocity or bounce back into the air, while too early and it would pick up enough additional speed after to be damaged by impact. To solve this problem, the boffins at the DMWD developed a plumb bob that hung a certain distance below the payload and would fire the rockets as soon as it touched the ground. Initial trials were conducted by simply dropping a concrete block fitted with rockets from a tall crane. Unfortunately, the project got off to an inauspicious start as the first block, fitted with too few rockets, simply buried itself in the ground while also being dramatically engulfed in a wreath of flame and smoke. Witnessing the impressive spectacle, one of the observers, Captain G.O.C. Davies, exclaimed, Look at it. It's Elijah in reverse referring to the biblical prophet who ascended to heaven in a chariot of fire. This resulted in the project being officially dubbed Hajile, or literally Elijah in reverse. Moving on to the second drop, this ended much like the first, while in the third, the engineers fitted the block with too many rockets, causing it to launch several dozen feet into the air before crashing back to the ground. These early tests also revealed the difficulties inherent in designing a reliable triggering device for the plumb bob had to be simultaneously heavy enough not to be blown upward by strong winds during descent and sensitive enough to to detect soft terrain like long grass. Following these disappointing trials, the Hajile team decided to conduct all further experiments over the sea, which would not only provide an ideal flat surface to test triggering devices, but also hopefully allow test rigs to be recovered intact. For these water-based tests, rather than a crane, the test articles were dropped from a Lancaster heavy bomber, much as they would be once Hajile entered service. Unfortunately, the first few drops landed too far away to be successfully recorded, so the engineers asked the Lancaster pilot to drop the next payload close to the pier. I mean, what could go wrong with that? To their horror, the pilot took their request a little too literally, as team member Gerald Paulet later recalled, As Agile came screaming through the air, the watchers on the pier gazed open-mouthed. Then, suddenly realizing that it was going to score a direct hit, everyone started running for dear life down the long plank roadway. The concrete bomb landed squarely on the roof of DMWD's engineering shop. It sheared through a massive steel joist and then demolished the covered way leading to the steamer jetty. Happily, there were no casualties, though the Wren, the WR, RNS, Women's Royal Naval Service cooks preparing lunch a few feet from the wreck shelter, thought that the end of the world had come. So, whoops a daisy. Following the hair raising incident, the Hajile team finally began to make some progress when they increased the number of rockets from four to eight. In this configuration, the test blocks came to a complete stop just a few feet above the water before sinking slowly beneath the surface. Buoyed by this encouraging success, the Hajile team decided to move on from concrete blocks to actual payloads and attempted to convince the Royal Navy to provide them with a number of jeeps for testing. Understand the Navy was skeptical about risking personal
perfectly good vehicles on such an unproven and potentially destructive device, and the DMWD was forced to procure its jeeps from the United States Navy instead. Unfortunately, the Royal Navy's fears were well-founded as the first test drop ended in spectacular failure. Snowfall had dampened the rocket fuses, causing the rockets to fail and the jeep hit the ground at terminal velocity, completely destroying it. After two weeks of tinkering, the team was ready to try again. This time, the rockets fired right on cue, but when the smoke cleared, the team discovered the jeep lying upside down. Further tests were no more successful, with the system proving maddeningly difficult to get working reliably. As for the flipping issue, one major problem was the difficulty of getting the primitive cordite rockets to ignite simultaneously, a shortcoming that caused many test articles to flip over or tumble end over end. Moving on from there, matching the thrust of the rockets to the weight of the payload also proved tricky, leading to many payloads crashing to the ground at high speed or being launched erratically back into the air. Ultimately, while the team came tantalizingly close to perfecting the system, the end of Agile finally came on June 6, 1944, the day of the D-Day landings, when an electrician accidentally triggered the rockets on a test rig while the engineering team was gathered around it. The resulting blast injured several people, including photographer Louis Kamatsky, who was blinded for several days after receiving a blast of sand to the eyes. With the strategic need for Gile quickly fading, the project was temporarily shelved and then abandoned completely as the war and the DMWD came to an end. The hilarious failure of Hergile aside, the DMWD did make a great many useful contributions to the war effort, developing such devices as the Hedgehog and Squid anti-submarine mortars, methods for protecting ships against magnetic mines, and the Mulberry floating harbors used during the D-Day landings. However, on the other end of things, the Hergile was not the only of the DMWD's bizarre misfires. Among the group's more eccentric undertakings was a scheme called Kentucky Minstrels, which sought to disguise reflective rivers and canals used by German bombers as navigation aids at night as roads by coating them in a substance derived from coal dust. While the actions of wind and tide ultimately made the scheme impractical, on at least one occasion the effect proved remarkably convincing when a man out walking his dog at night mistook a camouflage canal for an asphalt road and ended up unexpectedly soaked. But perhaps the Weezers and Dodgers most bizarre creation was the Great Panjandrum, a giant rocket-propelled explosive wheel designed to be launched from a landing craft, rapidly roll up an invasion beach, and then destroy coastal defenses with a bang. Like a Gile, Pedandrum was a spectacular failure, but that's the subject for another video. Another related wartime project was the Jumping Tank, an attempt to use rockets to make light-armored vehicles like the Valentine Tank and Universal Carrier leap over obstacles like canals or anti-tank ditches. Needless to say, this insane concept proved completely unworkable and the project was quickly scrapped. Interestingly, while Agile proved an abject failure, the concept of slowing airdropped payloads using retro rockets was later revived and successfully implemented, albeit as an enhancement rather than a replacement for parachutes. For example, ever since the first manned spaceflight by Yuri Gagarin in 1961, the Soviet Union and later the Russian Federation have opted to recover their space capsules on land rather than at sea like the American space program. There are several reasons for this. Firstly, unlike the Americans, the Russians do not possess a large enough naval surface fleet to perform efficient ocean recoveries. Secondly, during the Cold War, having spacecraft land within Russia's vast territory made them less likely to be captured by the enemy. However, this recovery method brought with it a key safety issue. Achieving a ground landing soft enough to prevent the cosmonauts from being injured required a parachute far larger than could be carried in the cramped capsule. The Vostok capsule flown by Gagarin solved this problem by having the cosmonaut eject and land separately from the spacecraft. However, the later Voskhod and Soyuz capsules landed with their crew still inside and used a system of solid fuel retro rockets to lessen the impact speed. On the Voskhod capsule, these rockets were mounted on the parachute shroud lines, while on the Soyuz, which is still in use today, uh, they are located under the heat shield, which is jettisoned just prior to landing. These six rockets are triggered by a gamma ray ultimator, codenamed Cactus 2V, between 1.1 and 0.8 meters from the ground, slowing the capsule from around 10 meters per second to around 2.5, resulting in a relatively light impact cosmonauts describe as a light thump. However, as it is possible that the retro rockets may fail, the crew couches are designed to withstand the impact of landing under only a parachute, though it is a decidedly less comfortable experience. In the 1970s, the Soviets also developed a hajile like landing system for the BMD-1, a lightweight armored fighting vehicle designed for use by airborne troops. Weighing only 7.5 tons, the BMD-1 can be carried by nearly any Russian transport aircraft and a handful of heavy lift helicopters and airdropped using a large multi-canopy cargo parachute. As this parachute lowered the vehicle at a bone-crunching 15-20 meters per second, or about 65 kilometers per hour or 40 miles per hour, the 
original operational doctrine called for the BMD-1 and its crew to be dropped separately onto the battlefield. In practice, however, the two tended to drift and land far apart, making it difficult for the crew to find and reach the vehicle. The Soviets thus began experimenting with dropping the BMD-1 with the driver and gunner abroad, using a system of retro rockets mounted on a drop pallet to slow the vehicle's impact speed to a more reasonable 7 meters per second. Other crew members who dropped separately were given radio receivers tuned to a beacon on the vehicle, allowing them to easily locate their mounts after landing. On July the 28th, 1944, a flight of P-51 Mustangs escorting a squadron of B-17 bombers on a mission near Merzburg, Germany, spotted something strange in the distance. A pair of white contrails rising at tremendous speed into the stratosphere. As the contrails pitched over and dove onto the bomber stream, the fighters broke formation to intercept. Seconds later, a pair of tiny egg-shaped aircraft with short swept-back wings flashed by and plunged back into the clouds, traveling faster than anything the American pilots had ever seen. It was the Allied Air Force's first encounter with a new German secret weapon. The rocket-powered Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet, an aircraft so fast its performance would not be matched for nearly a decade, yet so horrendously dangerous to fly it would claim the lives of more German pilots in development and training than Allied aircrew it took down in combat. Experiments with rocket-powered aircraft have a long history in Germany. In a series of increasingly audacious publicity stunts during the 1920s, automobile manufacturer Fritz Opel experimented with fitting gunpowder rockets to a variety of vehicles, from cars to railway wagons. These experiments culminated in the construction of the Lippisch Ant, or Duck, which on June 11, 1928, became the first manned aircraft to fly under rocket power. Later, in the 1930s, aircraft manufacturer Ernst Heinkel undertook a series of experiments to develop a a liquid-fueled rocket engine for use in aircraft. Heinkel's first success came in March 1937, when a modified HE-112 propeller-powered fighter flew under rocket power for 30 seconds. Heinkel next constructed the diminutive HE-176, which on June 20, 1939, became the first aircraft to take off, fly, and land solely under rocket power. But while Heinkel had high hopes for rocket aircraft, the German Air Ministry was decidedly less enthusiastic. On first being shown, the HE-176 General Oberst Ernst Udet, Director General of Equipment for the Luftwaffe, exclaimed, You want to fly with that? It has no wings. Those are running boards. On actually seeing the aircraft fly, Udet reportedly flew into a rage, declaring, That is no airplane. Leave it alone. I forbid you to fly it again. Even a demonstration in front of top Nazi dignitaries, including Adolf Hitler on July the 3rd, failed to make any impact, and Germany entered the Second World War with conventional propeller-driven aircraft. But the realities of war would soon force the high commands to change its mind. Starting in 1942, the Royal Air Force and United States Army Air Force began a concerted strategic bombing campaign against Germany and occupied Europe, pounding cities, factories, and other targets round the clock. The Luftwaffe, stretched thin by Hitler's invasion of Russia and chronically short on men and fuel, was unable to cope, and so the call went out for a fast, inexpensive rocket-powered interceptor that could stem the tide of Allied aircraft. The aircraft that would become the Comet emerged from the work of two aviation pioneers. The first was Alexander Lippisch, designer of the pioneering Ant, whose work with DFS, the German Research Institute for Sailplane Flight, was attempting to develop a unique high-speed tailless glider. In 1939, Lippisch left DFS and took his design to aircraft manufacturing. Messerschmitt, who gave it the designation ME-163. Messerschmitt soon began experimenting with fitting the 163 with a revolutionary new rocket engine designed by Helmuth Volta, who had also designed the engine for Heinkel's pioneering HE-176. Walter's R-1203 cold engine, originally developed as a jet-assisted takeoff or JATOPOD for helping overloaded transport aircraft get off the ground, reacted concentrated hydrogen peroxide with sodium permanganate to generate high-pressure steam, producing around a thousand pounds of thrust. The result was an aircraft of unprecedented performance. On the 2nd of October 1941, test pilot Heinrich Heine Dittmar flew the prototype ME-163A to a record airspeed of 1,003.67 miles per hour, becoming the first pilot to exceed a thousand miles per hour in level flight. Three years later, Dittmar would fly the improved 163B model to 1,130 miles per hour, a record that would not be beaten by a jet aircraft for almost a decade. The comet's climb rate also far exceeded that of any contemporary aircraft, being able to climb to an altitude of 39,000 feet in less than four minutes. This, in turn, required pilots to maintain a special low-fiber diet 
to prevent gas from expanding painfully in their gut. Even unpowered, the Comet displayed superb handling characteristics, with pilots reporting the aircraft to be nearly impossible to stall or spin. And so fast was it in a glide that, upon being buzzed by a 163A at 300 miles per hour, a startled Ernst Udert is reported to have exclaimed, What sort of engine has it? To which a presumably smug Alexander Lippisch replied, None. Yet, despite this blistering performance, the comic quickly revealed itself as an extremely hazardous aircraft to fly. Among its major flaws was its landing gear. For takeoff, the comet was fitted with a simple two-wheeled dolly, which was jettisoned as soon as the aircraft left the ground, after which the aircraft landed on a retractable ventral skid. However, if the pilot forgot to extend the skid or unlock the skid, the impact of landing could cause severe injuries. Indeed, during the comet's development, three of its main test pilots, Heine Dittmar, Rudy Oppertz, and Hannah Reich suffered serious spinal damage and skull fractures due to hard landings, and they spent several months in hospital recovering. But the greatest danger, by far, came from the Comet's engine. Helmuth Volta's HWK 509 hot engine, which powered the production ME163B, ran on a combination of two propellants, t stoff highly concentrated hydrogen peroxide, and c stoff a 30% mixture of hydrazine hydrate and methanol. These propellants were hypergolic, meaning that when mixed, they immediately and violently exploded. The fact that they were both colorless liquids meant that handling accidents were common, as in the case of one unfortunate ground crewman who inadvertently poured a container of tea stoff into another containing a small quantity of sea stoff. As author William Green recounts, before he realized the magnitude of his mistake, his remains had been spread thinly over the entire test shed. This extreme volatility meant that great care had to be taken when refueling the comet, with the repellents being loaded one at a time and the engine flushed out with water between each flight. But despite these measures, many comets and ground crew were lost to explosions before the aircraft ever left the ground. Even worse, tea stoff is highly corrosive and can strip flesh from bones in seconds. It also tends to react with even the smallest speck of dirt or organic matter, decomposing violently into scalding steam and oxygen, meaning it could only be stored in glass or enamel-lined containers. While Comet pilots were issued with special acid-proof asbestos flight suits, any landing made with propellant left in the tanks was likely to end in disaster, as Mano Ziegler, one of the few Comet pilots to survive the war, recounts in his memoirs. A certain Feldwebel, Alois Verndel from Aschau, an excellent fellow and completely reliable flying with the accuracy of a precision instrument, was chosen from among us pupils to make the first sharp start in the Comet. Make it good, Alois! We shouted, and and he was off. As expected, Alois's rocket motor cut out at about 6,000 meters altitude, and he turned back towards the field, as precise as ever. Then, without warning, side slip. The shout came from one of the group. Alois was much too high to touch down anywhere near the landing cross. Side slip, side slip. We all shouted as if he could hear us, but the comet shot past us and past the landing cross. Too high, too fast. Anxiously, we watched the comet touch down far outside the airfield perimeter, rebound into the air, drop back again like a brick, and then skid to some rough ground and turn over on its back. A split second later, a blinding white flame shot up, followed by a mushroom of smoke. On other occasions, pilots suffered a fate worse than an explosion, as with the case of Oberlieutenant Joseph Pons, who on one flight released his takeoff dolly too early. The dolly bounced off the ground and struck the aircraft, rupturing a T-stoff line. Pons immediately jettisoned his fuel and banked around to make an emergency landing, but just like Alois Verndel, missed the runway, touched down on rough ground and flipped over. To the relief of his watching comrades, his aircraft did not explode, but when they finally reached him and turned the comet over, they were greeted by a gruesome sight. T off leaking from the ruptured line had dissolved the unconscious poles alive. Despite these hazards, development of the comet pressed ahead, with the first operational squadron, Jagd Geshvada 400, receiving production ME163Bs in May 1944. The Model B was larger and more streamlined than the Model A, and equipped with armor protection for the pilot and a pair of MK108 30mm cannons with 60 rounds of ammunition each. Due to its limited engine endurance of only six minutes, the comet served as a point defense interceptor, with airfields being located next to strategic targets such as the Lunar Synthetic Fuel Works near Leipzig. To conserve fuel, the comet was towed to the runway by a modified agricultural tractor before having its propellant tanks fueled. The pilot then took off and climbed to an altitude of 39,000 feet before cutting the rocket motor and making a gliding dive onto the approaching bomber formation. The pilot would make as many attack runs as fuel and airspeed would allow before breaking off and gliding to a landing on the ventral skid. 
The now immobile comet would then be retrieved by another tractor and prepared for its next flight. The first operational sorties soon revealed yet another of the comet's many flaws. It was too fast. Due to the short range of its cannons during a high-speed approach, the pilot only had a window of around three seconds in which to aim and fire, making it impossible for all but the best marksmen to hit their targets. Engineers attempted to correct this issue by developing a unique weapon known as the SG-500 Jagdfaust. This consisted of a set of five 50mm cannon barrels mounted vertically in the wing roots and connected to a photocell, such that when the comet pilot passed into the shadow of a bomber, all ten barrels would fire automatically. Field trials revealed the system to be highly effective, with Lieutenant Fritz Kelb reporting that the B-17 he fired upon simply disintegrated. However, the war ended before the weapon could be deployed in large numbers. Meanwhile, though the comet's incredible speed and maneuverability had initially taken the Allies by surprise, escort fighter pilots soon learned how to counter them, with Lieutenant Colonel John Murphy and Lieutenant Cyril Jones of the American 359th Fighter Group shooting down the first ME-163 on August 16, 1944. Allied pilots also discovered the comet to be most vulnerable just after landing, and many were destroyed on the ground by roving fighter bombers. But in the end, what finished off the comet was the deteriorating state of the German war economy, and by early 1945, a shortage of pilots, fuel, and spare parts left the 370 aircraft produced laying idle on the ground. Only a handful of sorties were flown before Germany finally surrendered on the 8th of May 1945. So what, in the end, did the comet achieve? While exact figures are hard to come by, it is believed that between May 1944 and April 1945, ME-163 pilots shot down between 9 and 18 Allied bombers against a total of 10 comets lost in combat, with many more aircraft, pilots, and ground crew being lost to accidents during the comet's long and troubled development. Strategically, the comet was an abysmal failure, which, like so many other German wonder weapon projects, consumed vast quantities of resources and manpower that was urgently needed elsewhere while contributing little to the final outcome of the war. Yet despite this, the comet was an impressive technical achievement and closely studied by the Allies after the war. During the late 1940s and early 1950s, the United States, Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom all experimented with mixed power interceptors propelled by a combination of jet and rocket engines in order that combines the high speed and climb rate of the comet with the greater endurance and range of a regular jet. However, it was soon realized that the interceptor role was more economically filled by unmanned surface-to-air missiles, and the rocket-powered fighter faded into irrelevancy, an impressive but obscure footnote in the history of aviation. And now for some bonus facts. Only one Allied pilot ever flew the Comet under power, Royal Navy Captain Eric Winkle Brown, who to this day holds the record for the most different aircraft types flown by a single person. On May 17, 1945, Brown drove to the ME-163 airfield at Husum and asked the German ground crew to prepare an aircraft for him. At first, the crew refused, not only because of the dangerous nature of the aircraft, but because following a series of incidents in which Allied pilots were killed flying captured German aircraft, flights like the one Brown was requesting Questing were officially forbidden. Eventually, Brown agreed to sign a disclaimer absolving the crew of any responsibility, and they helped prepare and familiarize him with the aircraft. In 2014, in an interview, Brown recounted his experience as such. The noise is thunderous, and you are given a bit of a shake-up on takeoff. The acceleration is unbelievable. I thought the performance was, there's only one word for it, phenomenal, but I felt that I was flying in a tin coffin because the chances of bailing out were virtually nil. I took it on in the full knowledge of what the risk was, but at the end of the day, I felt a tremendous satisfaction in having beaten the odds. After landing safely, Brown and the no doubt relieved ground crew reportedly celebrated with a well-earned drink. And now for another bonus fact. Another weapon of desperation to emerge from German drawing boards at the end of World War II was the Bachem BA-349 Natter, or Viper, an aircraft that was essentially a manned, semi-disposable anti-aircraft missile. Realizing that taking off and landing from regular airfields made interceptors like the Comet vulnerable to attack by Allied aircraft, designer Erich Bachem conceived of an aircraft that could be launched vertically from a tower, allowing it to be easily hidden in forests. Built mostly of wood and other non-strategic materials, the Natter was powerful by the same Volta HWK-109 rocket engine as the ME-163, and armed with a battery of 24 55mm unguided missiles housed in its nose. Upon launch, an autopilot would guide the aircraft to operational altitude, whereupon the pilot would take over and intercept the incoming bomber formation. After expending his armament and fuel, the pilot would then jettison the cockpit section and bail out. The rear section of the aircraft would descend on its own parachute, allowing it to be recovered and the engine reused. While Bachem's design was 
rejected by the Air Ministry, it soon caught the attention of Heinrich Himmler, and development began in October of 1944 under the direction of the SS. Following a series of eight gliding flights and unmanned launches in April 1945, it was decided to proceed with a manned launch. On May the 1st, test pilot Lothar Cyber climbed into the cockpit and blasted into the air, becoming the first person to lift off vertically solely under rocket power. The launch proceeded smoothly until the NASA reached an altitude of 500 feet, whereupon the canopy, which had been insecurely latched, flew off, knocking Sieber unconscious. The NASA continued to rise to an altitude of 4,900 feet, whereupon it pitched over, plunged to the ground, and disintegrated on impact. Despite this setback, Sieber's flight was followed by four more successful manned launches, but the war ended before the NASA could be used operationally. But based on telemetry gathered from his ill-fated flight, it is likely that just prior to impact, Lothar Sieber achieved yet another first, becoming the first man, albeit briefly, to break the sound barrier. Though still remembered as a date which will live in infamy, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941 was only a prelude to the massive campaign of conquest that would soon spread untold death and destruction across Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Even before the first aircraft reached Hawaii, thousands of Japanese troops striking from bases in Indochina steamed across the Gulf of Thailand into British Malaya, catching the poorly equipped colonial forces completely off guard. What followed was a string of stunning victories as colony after colony fell like dominant under the Japanese onslaught. On the 10th of December, the mighty British battleships Repulse and Prince of Wales were sunk by Japanese aircraft, while on December the 24th, Japanese troops captured Borneo and the southern Philippines. Hong Kong fell the next day, followed by Burma, New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Singapore, Bali, and Timor. A key strategic target for the Japanese was the rich oil reserves of the Dutch East Indies in what is now Indonesia. Following their brutal invasion of China in 1937, Japan was subjected to an oil embargo by the Allied powers, cutting off the fuel needed to drive their territorial expansion. It was not until February 1942 that the reeling Allied forces were at last able to organize a counterattack. On February the 27th, a strike force of 14 British, Dutch, Australian, and American ships intercepted the Japanese invasion fleet off the coast of Java. The resulting battle of the Java Sea was a disaster for the Allies, who lost five ships and 2,300 sailors in the engagement, including Fleet Commander Admiral Carol Dorman. Following this and another defeat at the Battle of Sunda Strait the next day, all Allied ships in the Dutch East Indies were ordered to flee to Australia or Ceylon, modern-day Sri Lanka. Any vessels which could not make the journey were to be scuttled to deny their use to the enemy. Among these ships was the HM LMS Abraham Crinson, based at Surabaya in East Java. Named after the famous Dutch admiral who captured Suriname during the 1667 Anglo-Dutch War, the Abraham Crinson was one of eight Jan van Amstel class minesweepers built before the outbreak of war. Commissioned on May 26, 1937, in 1939 she was stationed in the Dutch East Indies along with her sister ship, the Jan van Amstel, Pieter de Bitter and Ellen Dubois. On receiving the signal to scatter on March the 6th, 1942, the sub-commander of the Pieta de Bitter, not wanting to endanger his crew, chose to scuttle his ship in Surabaya Harbour. The Jan van Amstel and Ellen Dubois decided to make a run for it, but quickly discovered they had insufficient fuel and were forced to anchor at Giliradia the next day. Meanwhile, while the Abraham Crianson had a full load of fuel, she faced the same major problem as the others. Designed for minesweeping and anti-submarine patrols in calm coastal waters, not only was she not particularly seaworthy in the open ocean, but her meager armament of one three-inch gun and two 20mm anti-aircraft cannons made her a sitting duck for marauding Japanese aircraft. Faced with insurmountable odds, Commander Anthony Van Miet and his crew came up with a plan best described as so crazy it just might work. Using trees and bushes cut from the surrounding jungle, the crew covered the ship in foliage to disguise it as a small tropical island with any uncovered areas being painted to match the local rocks and soil. While such a disguise might seem absurd on the face of it, the Indonesian archipelago contains more than 18,000 islands, many no larger than the Abraham Crianson. With the camouflage complete, Commander Van Meert gave his crew the choice to sail with him or remain in Java. Around half of the 40 Five men chose to stay, including all of the ship's indigenous personnel. Finally, at 9.30 p.m. on March the 6th, Abraham Crianson slipped her moorings and sailed out into the Java Sea. Commander Van Meert first headed to Gili Radia to rendezvous with the Jan van Amstel and Ellen Dubois, but on realizing that their lack of camouflage made them easy targets, he continued up the coast to Gili Gentang. This proved to be a good decision, for on March the 8th, the commander of the Ellen Dubois, realizing he had insufficient fuel to reach any friendly port, decided to scuttle his ship. Later, 
later that day, the Jan van Anstel was intercepted and sunk by the Japanese destroyer Arashiro as she attempted to break out of Lombok Strait. The Abraham Kriensen was now on her own. Over the next five days, the Abraham Kriensen slowly crept away along the Indonesian archipelago, heading southeast towards Australia. Since her wake was plainly visible from the air, she remained anchored and camouflaged near the shore during the day and only sailed under the cover of darkness. Incredibly, the deception worked, and on March the 11th, ship reached the open Indian Ocean, having never been spotted by the Japanese. Sailing at 10 knots to conserve fuel, she arrived in Fremantle, Western Australia, on March the 20th, 1942. She was the last Allied ship to escape from Java. Shortly after arriving in Australia, Commander Van Meert and nine of his men were awarded the Dutch Cross of Merit for their heroic escape. On December the 28th, 1942, the plucky little minesweeper turned island was refitted as an anti-submarine escort craft and commissioned into the Royal Australian Navy as HMAS Abraham Kriensen. Her crew was supplemented by survivors from the destroyed HMS Jupiter sunk at the Battle of Java Sea. She spent the rest of the war escorting convoys off the Australian coast. Her only major action came on January the 26th, 1943, when she and the Australian destroyer HMAS Bundaberg attacked a Japanese submarine in the Bass Strait. During the engagement, the Abraham Kriensen was seriously damaged by one of her own depth charges, requiring her to spend a week in dry dock undergoing repairs. Another amusing incident involved the common naval practice of hanging a portrait of the reigning monarch in the officer's wardroom. Though the ship was now under Australian command, the Dutch crew refused to allow the portrait of Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands to be replaced by one of King George VI. In the spirit of international goodwill, the ship's new commander left Lieutenant Arthur Irwin Chapman agreed to leave the Queen's portrait up and hunking George in his own cabin instead. As a compromise, however, the crew allowed him to hang a poster of the movie star Rita Hayworth on the bulkhead across from Queen Wilhelmina. Although the Abraham Kriensen was officially transferred back to the Royal Dutch Navy on May 5, 1943, she remained in Australia until 1945, when, in her last official act of the war, she cleared mines from Kupang Harbour ahead of the Japanese surrender in Timor. After the war, Abraham Kriensen conducted anti-revolutionary patrols during the Indonesian War of Independence before returning to the Netherlands in 1956 and serving as a boom defence ship. She was decommissioned in 1960 and given to the Dutch Sea Cadets, who used her until 1995, when she was acquired by the Dutch Navy Museum in Den Helder and placed on display as a museum ship. She is still open to the public today, the last surviving Dutch warship from World War II, and a reminder of the daring determination and ingenuity that eventually allowed the Allies to turn the tide of the battle in the Pacific. Flight simulators are often an integral part of pilot training, allowing trainees to log hundreds of flying hours and experience in as many emergency scenarios as possible without ever leaving the safety of the grounds. But while modern simulators with their advanced computerized displays and motion simulating hydraulics may seem like a relatively recent development, the idea of replicating the experience of flight on the ground is nearly as old as manned flight itself, with the first mass-produced simulator, the Link Trainer, appearing in the early 90s. 1930s. The brainchild of American aviator and inventor Edwin Link, the Link Trainer was a remarkably sophisticated device for its time and was produced and used in the tens of thousands by flying schools, airlines, and air forces around the globe. The Link taught an entire generation of pilots to fly and was one of the forgotten secret weapons that allowed the Allies to attain air superiority and victory in the Second World War. Edwin Albert Link Jr. was born on the 26th of July 1904 in Huntington, Indiana to Edwin a Link Sr. and Catherine Martin. In 1910, the family moved to Binghamton, New York State, when Edwin Sr. bought the bankrupt Binghamton Automatic Music Company, a manufacturer of pipe organs and player pianos. Renamed the Link Piano and Organ Company under the senior Link's management, the company flourished, its products selling well in New York and Pennsylvania, and even as far away as California, competing on equal terms with the more famous Wurlitzer Company. In 1918, the family separated, Catherine moved to Chicago to resume her singing career. Not wanting her younger son to grow up in the city, she sent Edwin to live with his aunt in Rockford, Illinois. Here, Edwin acquired his lifelong passion for aviation, reportedly after witnessing a troop of barnstormers fly into town. A common sight in rural America in the interwar years, barnstormers were nomadic pilots, many of them First World War veterans, who flew from town to town, putting on displays of stunt flying and offering airplane rides or even flying lessons to local townsfolk. But while young Edwin was enthralled by their feats of aerial 
Royal Daring Do, his father was less than supportive of his new obsession and pressured him to attend college like his older brother George. But Edwin was firmly drawn to the practical and the mechanical and instead enrolled in vocational training at Rockford Training High School and then Los Angeles Polytechnic High School. It was in Los Angeles that Edwin took his first flying lessons at a small field run by none other than Sidney Chaplin, brother of legendary movie star Charlie Chaplin. Right from the start, Edwin was less than impressed by the standard training procedure of the time. For the better parts of that hour, we did loops and spins and buzzed everything in sight. Thank heaven I didn't get sick, but when we got down, I hadn't touched the controls at all. I thought, that's a hell of a way to teach someone to fly, but I made a date for the next week anyway. I had two more lessons with Sydney, and they were pretty much like the first one. He did let me put my hands and feet on the controls during the maneuvers so that I could feel what he was doing. I didn't learn too much, however. I found out later that most of the old-time aviators, like Chaplin, started teaching their students by scaring them half to death. For Edwin, this was a painfully inefficient way of learning to fly, and an expensive one too, with each lesson typically costing between $25 and $50, which was $300 to $600 to Today. It would be nearly six years before he sat behind the controls of an airplane again. At the insistence of his father and older brother, Edwin enrolled at the Lindley Institute Military School in Pennsylvania, but while he enjoyed the military life, he found academic classwork dull and he soon dropped out, working briefly for the Western Electric Company before landing a job at his father's factory. Over the next few years, he traveled widely on behalf of the Link Company, installing and repairing organs and player pianos in churches, theaters, and musicals across the country. During this time, he also filed his first patent, a small vacuum for cleaning out the air holes in organs and pianos, and befriended a group of barnstormers headed by World War I ace Richard Dick Bennett. In 1926, he finally achieved his dream of flight when fellow pilot Alfred Stanley allowed him to solo in his aircraft. Upon hearing of his son's achievement, Edwin Sr., rather than be impressed and offering to pay for more flying lessons, was instead furious and fired his son on the spot. Thankfully, Edwin Jr. had an ally in George Thayer, the factory superintendent, who, recognizing the younger Link's mechanical talents, threatened to resign if little Edwin wasn't hired back. But by this time, Edwin Jr.'s heart was firmly set on aviation, and in 1928, he borrowed money from his mother to buy his first aircraft, a brand new Cessna Model AA. While ubiquitous today in the world of aviation, in 1928, the Cessna Aircraft Company of Wichita, Kansas, had only just been incorporated, and Edwin Link Jr.'s aircraft was the very first one to be delivered. Using this aircraft, Link went into business flying ferry and charter flights and formed his own professional barnstorming troupe. Unlike most of his contemporaries who drank heavily and boasted loudly of their flying abilities and wartime exploits, Link and his crew maintained a sober, professional image. Link later stating, I wanted to promote aviation, not kill it. Around this time, Link's thoughts returned to the problem of teaching pilots to fly in a safe and affordable manner. He had heard of a system used by the French during the war, whereby pilot trainees were introduced to the controls and basic handling of an aircraft by taxiing around on the ground. Known as the Penguin System, the technique dramatically cut down on training time by allowing students to master the basics without the stress and distraction of actual flight. Edwin began to wonder whether a device could be built to simulate the basics of flight while keeping the pilot safely on the ground. While primitive simulators like Sanders' teacher and early billing oscillator had appeared within a few years of the Wright brothers' epoch-making 1903 flight, none had been commercially successful, and in any case, what Link had in mind was far more sophisticated. Working out of the basement of his father's factory, Link spent a year building and perfecting his flight simulator, which he dubbed the Pilot Maker. The device consisted of a small plywood fuselage with stubby wings and a tail containing a cockpit with a full set of controls and instruments. Drawing on Link's intimate knowledge of organs and player pianos, the pilot maker was driven by vacuum pressure and pneumatic bellows to make the fuselage climb, dive, roll, and spin just like the real thing. Link immediately proved the device's effectiveness by teaching his brother George to solo after only six hours in the simulator and 42 minutes in an actual aircraft. On the 14th of April 1929, Link filed a patent for the pilot maker and established a workshop and flight school in the factory basement to build more simulators and use them to train prospective pilots. The revolutionary training course promised to teach students to fly after only 35 hours in the simulator and two in an actual aircraft, all for the remarkably low price of $85, which is about $1,300 today. While the pilot school was reasonably successful, with 100 students soloing in its first year of operation, Link found the pilot maker itself considerably harder to sell. Though he had hoped that the Army Air Force and the Navy would jump at such a useful training device, at first, the only buyers were county fairs and amusement parks who, as the November 19th 
1930 issue of Science and Invention Explained saw the pilot maker as little more than a sophisticated mechanical hobby horse. The device is the center of attention at the Mayfair Miniature Golf Course in Los Angeles, California, where it was first installed. Such devices would make a valuable adjunct to the multitude of miniature golf courses that now dot the country. Though disappointed, Link bowed to market pressure and began manufacturing pilot makers specifically for the amusement park crowd with a built-in coin slot and a scoring dial that removed points every time the rider deviated from a level flight path. But soon, slow sales were the least of Link's problems as the worsening Great Depression killed demand for organs and player pianos and forced the Link factory to close its doors. Over the next four years, Link took on various jobs in order to stay afloat, including aircraft maintenance, stunt flying and parachuting, and even founding one of New York State's first local airlines. Among his most successful schemes involved wiring lights to the bottom of an aircraft's wings to create a giant illuminated flying billboard. But in 1934, a major government scandal would finally give Link the opportunity he had been waiting for and prove the pilot maker's true value to the world. In 1920, after several years of experimental flights, the United States Post Office Department established the first regular transcontinental airmail service. At first, the work was contracted out to private companies, but this arrangement soon became marred in scandal. As compensation was based on carrying capacity and not actual mail volume carried, those with stock in the airmail companies began mailing each other lead weights and other heavy objects to pump up revenues. In February 1934, fed up with allegations of corruption and price fixing, the government withdrew the contracts and awarded them to the Army Air Corps, which began a government department that could be more tightly controlled. However, keeping a regular delivery schedule meant flying at night and in inclement weather, and the Army Air Corps had so little experience flying on instruments that a dozen pilots were killed in accidents in the first five months of service alone. On February the 10th, Edwin Link received a call from the Army Air Corps asking him to demonstrate the pilot maker at Newark Airport the next day. The weather the following morning was gray and foggy. And as the hours ticked past, the Army delegates assembled in the airport hangar began to realize that Link wasn't coming. But then, a lone airplane suddenly burst from the fog and made a perfect landing on the runway, and from it stepped Edwin Link. Without even having seen the pilot maker in action, the delegates concluded that anyone who could make such a landing must know something about flying on instruments, and soon thereafter, the Army Air Corps placed an order for six trainers at a cost of $3,400, about $66,000 today each. The Link Company was back in business. Over the next four years, Link would sell hundreds more pilot makers, now simply known as Link trainers, to the Army Air Corps and the Navy, as well as to dozens of private airlines and flight schools. In 1935, Link secured his first international sale to a Kurin company of Japan and was invited to travel to Japan to supervise their installation. The trip was strongly supported by the US government, who wanted Link to report back on Japan's military capabilities. Link arrived in Japan only to discover one of his simulators disassembled and laid out to be photographed. Unable to do anything about it, he nonetheless carried on with the rest of the visit despite knowing that his design would be copied and he would likely never sell another unit in Japan. During the early part of the Second World War, as the United States tried desperately to remain neutral, Link would sell simulators to many other countries who would soon become enemies, including Germany and Italy. By the time America entered the war in 1941, the Link trainer was being used by the air forces of some 35 countries. At this point, the ANT-18, the standard Link trainer used during the Second World War, was not merely a glorified amusement park ride, but rather a sophisticated device for teaching instrument flying. In in addition to being able to climb, dive, roll, and spin like an actual aircraft, the Link had a full set of instruments that behaved exactly as they would during flight. Amazingly, just like the Link trainer's movements, much of this simulation was accomplished not with electronics, but rather pneumatics. For example, pushing the control column forward on the back would let air in and out of a metal tank behind the instrument panel. The pressure inside the tank would be read by a pair of modified pressure gauges, which would give simulated values for altitude, airspeed, climb rate, and engine speed. Other instruments, like the artificial horizon and gyro compass, worked exactly as they would in a regular aircraft, while others were slightly modified to work without the g-forces encountered in actual flight. The trainer even featured a cam-powered pneumatic system for simulating turbulence, as well as a mechanism that would throw the student into a spin if they stalled in uncoordinated flight. And to force the student to use his instruments, the Link trainer was fitted with a hinged hood that could be lowered to cut off visibility of the outside world. The effect of all this was so realistic that one Navy trainee, finding himself in a 
particularly rough situation, reportedly threw open the hood and attempted to bail out, only to break his ankle as he fell to the floor three feet below. A short distance away from the link trainer sat the instructor, seated at a specially designed desk that allowed him to monitor the progress of the student's simulated flight. In addition to a duplicate instrument panel that displayed what the student saw in the cockpit, the desk also featured a small wheeled device called a crab, which rolled along in sync with the student's movements and traced out his flight path in ink on a map. The instructor could also communicate with the student using an intercom system and simulate airport beacons, blind landing systems, and other radio signals using a specialized transmitter. Incidentally, for much more on the inner workings of the Link Trainer, I'm going to link to an interesting YouTube video below. In any event, the increasing need for combat aircrew caused production to skyrocket, and Link established a new factory in Gananoc, Canada to keep up with demand. The factory produced nearly 5,000 Link Trainers over the course of the war, then at its peak, one Link rolled off the assembly line every 45 minutes. The devices were widely used by the US. US Army Air Corps, US Navy, and the Royal Canadian Air Force, where they played a pivotal role in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, a massive undertaking wherein nearly 170,000 British Commonwealth and Empire aircrew, nearly a third of all who served, were sent to Canada to be trained. In total, more than a million Allied pilots were trained in the Blue Box, the importance of which in securing Allied air superiority was such that after the war, the RCAF Air Marshal Robert Lackey would declare, The Luftwaffe met its Waterloo on all the training fields of the free world where there was a battery of Link trainers. After the war, the Link aviation devices would go from strength to strength, developing ever more sophisticated flight simulators, including those used to train the Apollo astronauts to land on the moon. And they are still around today, having been acquired in 2000 by L3 Communications and renamed L3 Link Simulation and Training. As for Edwin Link, in addition to developing simulators, he also became a pioneer in deep sea diving, developing some of the earliest ocean exploration submersibles, and becoming the first diver to breathe in a mixture of helium and oxygen underwater, a practice that is commonplace today. He died in Binghamton, New York, on September 7, 1981, at the age of 77, his creations having taught nearly three generations of pilots how to fly. Every day, millions of Americans carefully wash, sort, and set out their recycling for collection. But while many might feel proud to be doing their bit to help save the environment, such efforts are minuscule next to the gargantuan recycling effort that accompanied the Second World War. The term total war refers to a state in which every facet of a nation's economy and public life is committed to the prosecution of said war. No conflict in human history more fully embodies this ethos than World War II. Almost overnight, nearly every commodity imaginable became a strategic material feeding the hungry war machine. Household goods like gasoline, cloth, and staple foods were heavily rationed. Scrap metal drives scoured cities and towns for everything, from junked cars to toothpaste tubes. Housewives collected kitchen drippings to be turned into glycerin for explosives. And in Canada, colored ink became so scarce that comic book publishers were forced to print the now highly collectible Canadian whites. But few citizens could claim to have possessed a stranger strategic material than Miss Mary Babnick of Pueblo, Colorado. Born Mitzi Babnik in 1907 to Slovenian immigrant parents, Mary Babnik was famous for her long blonde hair, which by the 1940s had grown to a length of 34 inches or 83 centimeters, reaching down to her knees. She typically wore it in a long braid wrapped around her head, earning her the nickname The Lady with the Crown. In 1943, Mary was already contributing fully to the war effort, working by day at the National Broom Factory and teaching airmen from the local Air Force Base to dance every evening as a USO volunteer. But when Mary's brothers were barred from military service on medical grounds, she began to feel that even this wasn't enough. Both of my brothers were deferred and couldn't go. I was thinking of all those other boys and their families, the ones who had to go. I saw so many people crying their eyes out, not wanting their sons to go. I was sad. I wanted to do something for the war effort. Thus, when she saw an advertisement in a local paper calling for blonde, undamaged hair at least 22 inches or 56 centimeters in length, she immediately replied. In November, she was contacted by the Washington Institute of Technology, who asked her for a sample. Mary's hair, which had never been cut, curled, straightened, or washed with anything but natural soap, was exactly what the WIT was looking for, and in 1944, she agreed to have it cut. Though the government offered her compensation and war savings stamps, Mary refused, considering it her patriotic duty to contribute to the war effort. Nevertheless, the loss of her defining characteristic proved traumatic. After I did it, I cried and cried. I went to my mother and said, Mama, why did you let me cut my hair? 
It was two months before I went anywhere except to work. After two months, I got used to it, but at first I was so ashamed I wore a bandana to work so people wouldn't ask me about it. Over the years, a myth has emerged claiming that Mary Babnick's hair was used to make the crosshairs in the Norden bombsite carried aboard American B-17, B-24, and B-29 bomber aircraft. However, this is impossible, as the crosshairs in the Norden are not a separate component, but rather etched into the glass of one of the sighting lenses. So, what was it actually used for? While it's not fully clear in detail, it appears Mary's hair was used in the manufacture of precision hydrometers for measuring atmospheric humidity, measurements vital to the manufacture of certain aircraft components, and countless other war materials where accurate humidity measurement was essential, from the first nuclear weapons to intercontinental ballistic missiles and more. Despite her initial regret, Mary Babnick soon came to view her curious contribution to the war effort with pride, claiming in a 1990 interview that she would do it all again. In 1987, President Ronald Reagan sent her a birthday greeting thanking her for her wartime services, while in 1990 she was presented with a Special Achievement Award from the Colorado Aviation Historical Society. Mary Babadick died in 1991 at the age of 84. Now for a bonus fact. The Norden bombsite, the device that Mary Babnick's hair was erroneously believed to have been used in, was one of the most closely guarded secrets of the Second World War. First developed by Dutch-American engineer Carl Norden in the late 1920s, the device was extensively used aboard B-17, B-24, and B-29 bombers throughout the war. Unlike what is typically depicted in movies, the Norden was not merely simply a telescope and crosshairs for aiming, but rather a highly sophisticated mechanical computer and autopilot that kept the aircraft on a steady course, constantly recalculated the bomb's point of impact based on changing flight conditions, and automatically dropped the bombs when the aircraft arrived over the target. In fact, the Norden bombsite is best thought of not as one single device, but four. The first component of the Norden bombsite was the inertial platform, a set of two gyroscopes that kept the site stable and level relative to the ground, regardless of how the aircraft moved around it. The second component was the sighting eyepiece, which looked not straight down, but through a motorized prism that gave a view of the target ahead. By adjusting the speed of rotation of the prism so that the target remained fixed in the crosshairs, the bomber could effectively calculate the ground speed and position of the target relative to the aircraft. The site could then calculate when the aircraft had arrived over the release point and automatically drop the bombs. However, the fall of the bombs was affected by numerous other factors, including altitude, air temperature, and wind direction and velocity. Therefore, the bomber had to use the site's third component, a mechanical computer, to compensate for these. Throughout the bombing run, he would constantly adjust these values by trial an error in order to keep the target centered in the crosshairs. While early versions of the Norden included a device that signaled course corrections to the pilot to keep the aircraft on a correct heading, the finalized Mark 15 version used throughout World War II incorporated a fourth component, an autopilot. This would fly the aircraft throughout the bombing run. Thus, on the approach to the target, the plane would be flown not by the pilot, but rather by the bombsite and the bomber, whose constant wind speed, altitude, and heading corrections would automatically adjust the aircraft's course. In pre-war testing, the Norden display phenomenal accuracy. With a circular air probable, the diameter of the circle in which half of the bombs could be expected to fall of only 75 feet. This performance informs the American doctrine of daylight precision bombing, which held that military targets such as factories or marshalling yards could be hit from high altitude with minimal collateral damage, even if said targets were located within built-up civilian areas. Or, as U.S. air crews famously put it, they could drop a bomb into a pickle barrel from 30,000 feet. This accuracy also theoretically allowed Navy aircraft to attack fleets of enemy ships at sea via high-altitude level bombing. The Norden was considered so vital to U.S. air power that its design and production was given top-secret status, and bombers were made to swear an oath to destroy their bombsite before bailing out of a stricken aircraft, either by heaving it overboard or emptying their service pistols into the mechanism. Yet despite this vaunted reputation as a top-secret war-winning weapon, under actual combat conditions, the Norden's performance proved decidedly lackluster. Its CE EP growing to over 1,200 feet, about the same as simpler British and German bombsites. Aircrew flying daylight raids ran into the same problem faced by the British earlier in the war, namely that flying straight and level over a target for minutes on end tended to make bombers extremely vulnerable to enemy fighters and anti-aircraft fire. Who would have thought? While high casualties had forced the British to switch to night raids and area bombing whereby entire cities were targeted rather than individual targets, the USAAF persisted with daylight raids, instead developing new tactics to improve bombing accuracy and aircraft survivability. These included the Combat Box, a special flight formation in which bomber gunners could better defend each other against fighter attack, and the Lead Bomber Tactic, in which only a single aircraft would use its Norden to find the target, with the other bombers in the formation dropping their bombs on 
on its command. Regardless, bombing proved almost impossible to achieve, and the USAAF increasingly began adopting less discriminate area bombing attacks. Meanwhile, the Navy largely abandoned its northern bomb sites and embraced dive bombing and skipper bombing to more accurately attack enemy ships. Despite extensive attempts to keep its design a secret, details of the Norden's operation did fall into German hands through both espionage and crashed aircraft. However, little attempt was made to reverse engineer it due to what the Germans saw as unnecessary complexity. And despite its failure to live up to expectations, the Norden was the best the US military had, and it served through the rest of the war, being used to drop both atomic bombs and soldiered on through Korea and Vietnam, its last use occurring in 1967 when it was used to drop electronic sensors onto the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The man-lined Project Pigeon, a plan to attempt to use pigeons to guide missiles, was famed American behaviorist and Harvard professor B. F. Skinner. He teamed up with the U.S. Army to develop such a system. Pigeons were trained using operant conditioning, a type of learning pioneered by Skinner in 1937, where behavior is modified by its consequences. In this case, Skinner rewarded pigeons for pecking an image on a screen to get them conditioned doing it. Skinner then designed the nose cone for missiles that had three windows for the pigeon, or up to three pigeons in some tests, to look through. Via the flight control system and a metal piece on the nose of the pigeons to detect a peck, the pecking of the windows would result in the missile changing course, depending on which window was pecked and where on the window the pecking happened. The pigeons were then trained such that the target, whatever object the pigeon was conditioned to go for, stayed centered in front of the missile. The National Defense Research Committee was skeptical of pigeons guiding missiles, but contributed $25,000 which is about $321,000 today, toward research into it anyway. Even with this support, Skinner's idea was considered eccentric, and there were few in power who would take him seriously. However, in simulation, the pigeons, who can process visual information roughly three times faster than humans, were remarkably good at guiding the missile straight to the target once they were properly trained. They rarely missed in the simulator. However, despite this, in October of 1944, the project was cancelled due to the belief of army decision makers that investing more time and money into it would delay the development of other projects that had more promise of being successful. There was also, of course, some unease in entrusting the guidance of a missile to a bird. As Skinner stated, the problem was not that the system didn't work when tested in the simulator, it was that no one would take us seriously. This wasn't the end of Project Pigeon, though. It was brought back by the Navy in 1948, only this time called Project Orcon for organic control. It was cancelled in 1953 thanks to advancements in electronic guidance systems. It should be noted here that even after Project Pigeon funding was over, Skinner decided to keep the pigeons to see how long they would remember how to guide missiles to targets. It turns out that for those that lived that long, even as much as six years later, they still remembered what to do. Now on to the literal bat bombs. These were another experimental weapon considered by the US during World War II at the suggestion of a dentist, Dr. Lytle, who was a friend of the First Lady. These bombs consisted of a bomb-shaped casing with several compartments inside. Each compartment housed a Mexican free-tailed bat. Each bat had a small incendiary device attached to it. The casings were refrigerated in order to lower the bat's body temperature and force them into hibernation until they were dropped from a plane shortly before dawn. A parachute would slow the descent, and eventually the casing would be triggered to open and release the bats. As bats in sunlight would seek roosts in dark places like attics, when they were released and the sun came out, they'd seek such places. The hope was that with the incendiaries timed to go off all at once, this would start fires in places that were hard to access to fight a fire. Further, in many cases, the fire's existence wouldn't be noticed until it had established itself. It was thought that bat bombs would be particularly effective in Japan, where buildings were then made largely out of wood and paper. If several hundred thousand of these bats were released in major Japanese, Japanese cities and towns, they would go up in flames, which would result in much smaller losses of life than by carpet bombing or later a nuclear strike. Essentially, it would help take out the infrastructure while minimizing civilian casualties. Now, while on the surface this plan may seem far-fetched, the US agreed to develop the bat bomb for four reasons. Bats are available in large numbers. Four caves in New Mexico alone are each believed to be the home to millions of bats. Bats carry more than their own weight in flight, up to three times their weight. Bats 
bats can hibernate for extended periods without the need of food or water, and finally, bats fly in the dark and then find secluded places to hide at sunrise. The program, well, it was actually mildly successful, but in a bad way. During testing, some of the bats with incendiary devices attached escaped, resulting in a large part of the base they were being tested at, Carlsbad Army Airfield Auxiliary Air Base, burning down. The results in the controlled testing were also very promising, and it seemed like this would actually work well. In fact, it was estimated that while standard incendiary bombs would probably start about 167 to 400 fires per major bomb load in a major Japanese city, based on the testing, the bat bombs would probably produce about 3,000 625 to 4,748 fires per load. Further, just 10 B-24 bombers could carry an astounding 1,040,000 bats, which were strapped with 17 to 28 grams of incendiary explosive. However, this program it was cancelled, as with the pigeons, not because it didn't work, but for other reasons. In this case, because it was estimated that the bats would not be ready for deployment until mid-1945. Despite the promising results in testing, the program was considered to be moving too slowly, and with an estimated $2 million invested in it, which is about $25.7 million today, it was too expensive. Instead, the Manhattan Project was deemed a more likely candidate for ending the war sooner, as it was thought to be progressing quicker and certainly would have a more dramatic effect if it was ultimately successful. Both for the historical novelty of ending World War II with literal bat bombs and for avoiding having to use a nuclear weapon in war and the massive loss of life that ensued, I think we can all agree that it's too bad the timetable on the bat bomb project project was considered too long. For reference, Little Boy and Fat Man were deployed on August the 6th and 9th of 1945 respectively. So, at the original timetable, the bats would actually have been ready sooner had the project continued to be funded. And now for a bonus fact. Pigeons were also used as messengers during both world wars. The US and the United Kingdom created special pigeon service units with tens of thousands of birds. One pigeon, which had the nickname of Gustav but was officially known as Bird NPS.42.3106, Six, flew over 150 miles to England on D-Day to deliver a message about the Normandy landings. Just before we finish today in researching this video, we found an excellent book which I'd like to recommend. It's called Bat Bomb, World War II's Other Secret Weapon. It basically goes into way more detail than we got into in this video. There's a link to the Amazon page with this book below. At 8.15 a.m. on August the 6th, 1945, the citizens of the Japanese city of Hiroshima looked up to see three bright silver B-29 Superfortress bombers droning overhead. This was nothing unusual. For the past year, the U.S. 20th Air Force had conducted round-the-clock firebombing raids of the Japanese home islands, reducing large swaths of Tokyo and other cities to ashes. But as the people of Hiroshima watched, one of the aircraft released not a string of tiny incendiaries, but a single, very large bomb. 20 seconds later, a blinding flash brighter than the midday sun filled the air. A searing fireball enveloped the downtown core, vaporizing its inhabitants instantly, while all around the city buildings spontaneously burst into flames. Within hours, 13 square kilometers of the city lay in ruins, and 129,000 of its 348,000 citizens were dead or wounded. And over this devastation rose a roiling, radioactive mushroom cloud. The age of atomic warfare had begun. The story of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and the man who carried it out, Colonel Paul W. Tibbetts, is well known and has been told and retold in countless books, articles, and documentaries. Yet often overlooked, or at least covered to a much less degree outside of mentioning the name of the city, is the story of the second atomic bomb dropped on the city of Nagasaki just three days later. Despite this, in many ways, the second mission was even more important than the first, often credited with convincing the Japanese to surrender and end the war. It was also far more dramatic, plagued with endless bad luck and hair-raising close calls. This is the forgotten story of Charles W. Sweeney and Boxcar, the man and machine that dropped the second and so far last atomic bomb in the history of warfare. Charles William Sweeney was born on December the 27th, 1919 in Lowell, Massachusetts. The son of a plumber, he graduated from North Quincy High School in 1937, after which he attended evening classes at Boston University and Purdue. On April the 28th, 1941, Sweeney joined the U.S. Army Air Corps as an aviation cadet, receiving his commission as lieutenant in December of that year, just after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. 
Assigned as a flight instructor and test pilot, Sweeney spent two years at Jefferson Proving Grounds, Indiana, before being sent to Eaglin Field, Florida. In 1944, he was promoted to the rank of major and reassigned once more to Grand Island, Nebraska. Here, Sweeney was tasked with teaching pilots how to fly the brand new Boeing B-29 Super Fortress, a truly massive and powerful aircraft with fuselage 30 meters long, a wingspan of 43 meters, four 1,600 kilowatt engines, and the latest in pressurization, navigation, bomb aiming, and aerial defense technology. It was thanks to Sweeney's extensive experience with the B-29 that later that same year, he was invited to Wendover Field, Utah, to participate in a mysterious project called Silver Plate. An offshoot of the top-secret Manhattan Project, which had developed the first atomic bombs, the purpose of Silver Plate was to develop a practical means of deploying these brand new weapons in combat and train air crew to carry out atomic bombing missions. Towards this end, 17 B-29s were expensively modified, having their bomb bays enlarged and fitted with special winching, suspension, and release mechanisms to accommodate the heavy and bulky atomic bombs. To reduce weight and increase their range, the aircraft was also stripped of all their armor and defensive armament except for two 50 caliber machine guns in the tail. To the surprise of many silver plate pilots, these modifications made the B-29 incredibly maneuverable, allowing it to outturn even P-47 Thunderbolt fighters in simulated combat. On December the 17th, 1944, the Silver Plate B-29s and their crews were organized into a specialized unit known as the 509th Composite Group, headed by Colonel Paul W. Tibbetts, the man who would later fly the atomic bombing mission over Hiroshima as mentioned. On December the 17th, 1944, the Silver Plate B-29s and their crews were organized into a specialized unit known as the 509th Composite Group, headed by Colonel Paul W. Tibbetts. Over the following six months, the 509th trained intensively for their upcoming missions, flying long, overwater navigation missions from Batista Field in Cuba and conducting precision bombing practice over Wendover Field. The Manhattan Project produced two atomic bomb designs, codenamed Little Boy and Fat Man. Little Boy was a gun-type weapon fueled by uranium-235. When detonated, a small propellant charge launched one subcritical mass of uranium into another, creating a supercritical assembly and triggering a nuclear chain reaction. Fat Man, by contrast, was an implosion-style weapon which used a set of high-explosive lenses to create a spherical shockwave and compress a baseball-sized plutonium-239 core to criticality. Compared to plutonium-239, uranium-235 was extremely labor-intensive to enrich, meaning that by early 1945, only enough had been produced to fuel a single bomb. Consequently, the Little Boy design was not tested before being dropped over Hiroshima, while nearly all future nuclear weapons would be based on the Fat Man design. However, the implosion concept was unproven and would not be shown to work until the successful detonation of the Trinity device, the world's first nuclear explosion, on July the 16th, 1945. Nonetheless, the 509th continued to train for their still hypothetical missions. Due to its unusual shape and size, the Fat Man bomb behaved very differently from conventional aerial weapons. Thus, to familiarize the crews with its handling, Captain William Parsons and Charles Loritzen of the Manhattan Project's Ordnance Division created an inner training version known as Pumpkin Bombs. Named after their bulbous shape and the dark yellow zinc chromate paint they were delivered in, pumpkin bombs were produced in two versions, an inert version filled with plaster and cement, and a live version filled with 2,500 kilograms of Composition B explosive. Both fillings were designed to closely approximate the weight distribution of the atomic physics package that would eventually go inside the casings. A total of 486 pumpkin bombs were produced by the end of the war, with the inert versions being delivered directly to Wendover Field. Finally, on May the 4th, 1945, Major Sweeney was made commander of the 393rd Bombardment Squadron. Four weeks later, in late May and early June, he and the rest of the 509th were deployed to the island of Tinian in the northern Pacific Marianas chain. Only 2,400 kilometers south of Tokyo, the tiny 100 square kilometer island was an ideal launching point for U.S. Army Air Force bombing raids against the Japanese home islands, and was captured on August 1, 1944, after a week of savage fighting that claimed the lives of 300 American and 6,000 Japanese soldiers. Almost as soon as the fighting ceased, Navy the Construction Battalion, or Seabees, moved in and began transforming the island into the world's largest airbase. As Manhattan Project weaponeer Philip Morrison later recalled, Tinian is a miracle. Here, 6,000 miles from San Francisco, the United States Armed Forces have built the largest airport in the world. 
a great coral ridge that was half leveled to fill a rough plain and to build six runways, each an excellent ten-lane highway, each almost two miles long. Beside these runways stood in long rows the great silvery airplanes. They were not by the dozen, but by the hundred. From the air, this island, smaller than Manhattan, looked like a giant aircraft carrier, its deck loaded with bombers. Once on Tinian, the 509th continued its training. Accompanying units of the 20th Air Force on conventional firebombing raids, they practiced for their upcoming atomic missions by dropping high-explosive pumpkin bombs. Between the 20th of July and 8th of August 1945, the 509th dropped a total of 43 pumpkin bombs on 12 Japanese cities, including Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka. Then, on July the 26th, 1945, the moment they had been waiting for finally arrived. On that day, UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill, US President Harry Truman, and Chinese Chairman Zhang Kai-shek issued the Potsdam Declaration, which called for the government of Japan to proclaim now the unconditional surrender of all the Japanese armed forces and to provide proper and adequate assurances of their good faith in such action. The alternate for Japan is prompt and utter destruction. The following day, leaflets were dropped over 11 Japanese cities warning of their imminent destruction. Yet despite these apocalyptic ultimatums, the Japanese roundly ignored the Potsdam Declaration. Meanwhile, some 3 million Allied troops were massing in the Pacific in preparation for Operation Downfall, the planned amphibious invasion of the Japanese home islands. With the Japanese population expected to fight frantically to the death, the predicted casualties were horrific, as high as 800,000 Allied servicemen and 10 million Japanese soldiers and civilians. Thus, in a bid to end the war quickly and save Allied lives, on August the 3rd, President Truman issued the order to drop the atomic bombs on Japan. The Little Boy Uranium Bomb, which had been delivered to Tinian by the USS Indianapolis on the same day as the Potsdam Declaration, was quickly readied for use, and in the early morning hours of August the 6th, the B-29 and Nola Gay, piloted by Colonel Tibbets, took off for Hiroshima. She was accompanied by two other superfortresses, Necessary Evil, piloted by Captain George W. Marquardt, and the Great Artiste, piloted by Major Sweeney. These aircraft carried scientific instruments and cameras to record the blast and measure its effect on the city. Three other aircraft flew ahead to observe the weather over Hiroshima and the two secondary targets, Kokura and Nagasaki. The crews flew a textbook mission encountering no enemy opposition, dropping the bomb right on target, and returning to Tinian 12 hours later. Waiting on the tarmac was General Carl Spatz, commander of the Strategic Air Forces in the Pacific, who personally awarded Colonel Tibbets the Distinguished Service Order. Yet despite unleashing more death and destruction more quickly than any military attack in history, Enola Gay's mission seemed to have little effect on the Japanese government, who continued their policy of silence. This was only partly due to fanaticism. The utter devastation inflicted on Hiroshima interrupted communications coming out of the city, likely making it difficult for the government to fully grasp the enormity of what had happened. Whatever the case, with no response to the Potsdam Declaration in sight, President Truman approved the use of the second atomic bomb. On August the 8th, the 509th received Operation Order No. 39, assigning command of the second atomic bombing, codenamed Special Mission No. 16, to Charles Sweeney and his crew. Sweeney would fly the B-29 Boxcar, named after its regular pilot, Captain Frederick C. Bach, and would be accompanied by the Great Artiste, flown by Bach, and Big Stink, flown by Major James I. Hopkins, Jr. Sweeney's crew on Boxcar comprised 12 men, co-pilots Captain Charles D. Albury and Lieutenant Frederick J. Olivi, Navigator Captain James F. Van Pelt, Jr., Bombardier Captain Kermit Behan, Radio Operator Staff Sergeant Abe M. Spitzer, Flight Engineer Staff Sergeant John D. Correct, Radar Operator Staff Sergeant Edward K. Buckley, Central Fire Control Gunner Staff Sergeant Albert T. DeHart, and Mechanic and Tail Gunner Staff Sergeant Raymond G. Gallagher. Though as the aircraft had been stripped of nearly all its defensive armament, the latter two crews served mainly as observers. Also aboard were Lieutenant Commander Frederick L. Ashworth and Lieutenant Philip M. Barnes, the weaponeers in charge of arming the Fat Man Bomb, and Lieutenant Jacob Beeser, a radar countermeasures expert and the the only man to fly both atomic missions aboard the attacking aircraft. Meanwhile, the Great Artiste and Big Stink carried scientific and recording equipment, as well as Manhattan Project scientist Dr. Robert Serber, New York Times reporter William L. Lawrence, Group Captain G. Leonard Cheshire, member of the British Military Mission to the United States, and Dr. William G. Penney, Professor of Applied Mathematics, London University, and the man who would later head the development of the British atomic bomb. The flight path called for Boxcar, the Great Artiste, and Big Stink to rendezvous over the island of Iwo Jima, then proceed towards the target at an altitude of 31,000 feet. 
Ships, submarines, and a fourth B-29 full house were on standby along the flight path in case any of the aircraft were forced to ditch, while another two B-29s, Enola Gay and Lagan Dragon, flew on ahead to scout the weather over the targets. The primary target for the mission was Kokura, with Nagasaki as the secondary. Kokura was a major weapons manufacturing center and home of the Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Work, while Nagasaki was one of the largest shipbuilding and repair centers in Japan. But while most target cities had been spared conventional bombing so that the effects of the atomic bomb could be more easily gauged, Nagasaki had been firebombed just a few weeks prior, making it a less desirable target. Nagata was briefly considered as a possible third target, but was too far away from Kokura and Nagasaki to be practical. Though the crews would face many risks, including weather, enemy guns, and aircraft, and the possibility of the bomb malfunctioning or detonating midair, Sweeney later admitted that his greatest fear was screwing up, especially after Tibbet's textbook mission. I'd rather face the Japanese than Tibbet's in shame if I made a stupid mistake. But fortune, it seemed, was not on Sweeney's side, for the whole mission seemed jinxed from the start. The first hiccup occurred right before takeoff when a mechanic informed Sweeney that due to a failed fuel pump, it would be impossible to use the 600 gallons of reserve fuel in the bomb bay tank. As the pump would take hours to fix, Sweeney decided to proceed without it. Then, while taxiing onto the runway, Major Hopkins, Big Sting's pilot, forced Dr. Robert Serber to disembark because he had forgotten his parachute. As Serber was the only man who knew how to operate Big Sting's high-speed camera, Hopkins was forced to break radio silence to receive instructions on its use. From here, Boxcar lifted off from Tinian at 3.49 a.m. local time and flew northeast toward the rendezvous point. En route, Lieutenant Commander Ashworth and Lieutenant Barnes armed the bomb, replacing the green safety plugs with red arming plugs. Soon after, the next hiccup in the mission arrived as bad weather over Iwo Jima forced Sweeney to divert to Yakushima in the Ryukyu Islands. But when he finally arrived, only Bach in the Great Artiste was there to meet him. Hopkins, having gotten lost in thick cloud cover, was circling a point several hundred kilometers south. Due to the inoperative reserve fuel tank, Sweeney had been instructed to linger no longer than 15 minutes at the rendezvous point, but he waited for 45, scanning the horizon for any sign of Big Stink. Meanwhile, Hopkins decided to break radio silence, calling in to the ether, Chuck, where the hell are you? But it was too late, Sweeney decided he had waited long enough, turned northeast and headed towards Kokura. Some hours later, the mission faced another hair-raising brush with disaster. The electronic diagnostic box connected to the bomb featured a red light. So long as the light blinked at a steady rhythm, all was well. Suddenly, however, the light began blinking irregularly, causing Ashworth and Barnes to leap into action. If the arming circuits had somehow been activated, the bomb could detonate in the bomb bay, vaporizing Boxcar and the Great Artiste. But after several minutes of frantic searching, the weaponeers finally located the fault. A pair of rotary switches in the diagnostic box had somehow been wired backwards. When the wires were reversed, the light returned to its regular rhythm. Disaster had been averted. For now, at least. Six hours after takeoff, the two bombers finally arrived over Kakura. Though the weather aircraft had reported only three-tenths cloud cover, by the time the strike force arrived, the city was completely obscured, with smoke from a firebombing raid on nearby Yahada making visibility even worse. Under strict orders to make the bombing run visually, Sweeney made three long passes over the city, but Captain Behan was unable to spot the target through his Norden bomb site. Meanwhile, in the tail gun position, Staff Sergeant Gallagher reported seeing bursts of anti-aircraft fire and Japanese fighter aircraft through the haze. Finally, after circling Kokura for 50 minutes, Sweeney accepted defeat and diverted for the secondary target, Nagasaki. But misfortune continued to plague the mission, for the weather conditions over Nagasaki were little better than Kokura, the city being obscured under nine-tenths cloud cover. Running low on fuel, Sweeney considered breaking his orders and dropping the bomb by radar. The alternatives, as he later recalled, were less than desirable. We would not have landed with the bomb on board. We would have released it somehow or other. We would have dived the airplane into the target. I told that to my crew. I said, you were with me the other day on Hiroshima, and now Colonel Tibbetts did a great job. I was trying to get their adrenaline going. You know, the pep talk between the halves or something. I said, now we're going to deliver this bomb. We're not going to bring it back. If we have to, we're going to dive the airplane into the target. I don't think it would have gone off if we did, but they didn't know that. Well, I would have never done that. I would have taken them out to our ship and bailed them out and maybe take our bombardier back with me and dive into the target. But when you're young like that, you feel that, at least I felt, you're only paying your dues if you have to. 
But then, as co-pilot Lieutenant Olivia later recalled, the mission's luck finally changed. We started an approach, but Baron couldn't see the target area. Van Pelt, the navigator, was checking by radar to see if he has the right city, and it looked like we would be dropping the bomb automatically by radar. At the last few seconds of the bomb run, Behan yelled into his mic, I've got a hole! I can see it! I can see the target! Apparently, he had spotted an opening in the clouds only 20 seconds before releasing the bomb. Using the Mitsubishi Sports Stadium as an aiming point, Behan released the bomb at 11.01 a.m. local time. Meanwhile, the Great Artiste dropped three instrument packages on parachutes. Immediately, Sweeney and Bach pulled their aircraft into sharp 60-degree left banks. Then, 50 seconds after release, a blinding flash filled the air. As reporter William Lawrence, watching from the Great Artiste, later recounted, We removed our glasses after the first flash, but the light still lingered on, a bluish-green light that illuminated the entire sky all around. A tremendous blast wave struck our ship and made it tremble from nose to tail. This was followed by four more blasts in rapid succession, each resounding like the boom of a cannon fire hitting our plane from all directions. We watched a giant pillar of purple fire 10,000 feet high shoot upward like a meteor coming from the earth instead of from outer space. It was no longer smoke or dust or even a cloud of fire. It was a living thing, a new species of being born right before our incredulous eyes. Even as we watched, a giant mushroom came shooting out of the top to 45,000 feet, a mushroom top that was even more alive than the pillar, seething and boiling in a white fury of creamy foam. Thousand geysers rolled into one. It kept struggling in an elemental fury like a creature in the act of breaking the bonds that held it down. When we at last saw it, it had changed its shape into a flower-like form, its giant petals curving downward, creamy white outside, rose-colored inside. The boiling pillar had become a giant mountain of jumbled rainbows, but awe suddenly turned to terror as the fruits of the airman's labor began to catch up with him. As Lieutenant Olivia recalled, Right after the blast, we had lunged downward and away from the radioactive cloud. We felt three separate shock waves, the first being the most severe. As the mushroom cloud kept on climbing towards us, bright flames, a sickly pink, were shooting out of its interior. I had a sickish feeling in the pit of my stomach that we were going to be enveloped by the cloud. We had been warned many times about the possibility of radiation poisoning if we flew into it. Actually, I think the mushroom cloud missed us by about 125 yards before we pulled away from it. The briefings and all practice we had on evasive tactics now had special meaning. Their mission accomplished and dangerously low on fuel, the two B-29s circled the city once before turning for home. Meanwhile, Major Hopkins in full house spotted the flash and mushroom cloud from 160 kilometers away and flew over in the hopes of photographing the damage. Unfortunately, by the time he arrived, the city was completely obscured by clouds and smoke. Without enough fuel to reach Tinian, Sweeney instead headed for the island of Okinawa, reducing his engine speed and leaning his mixture in order to save fuel. At long last, he spotted the runways of Yonten Field and radioed that he was coming in for an emergency landing. When the airfield did not respond, he ordered the crew to fire off every emergency flare on board. Lieutenant Olivia described what happened next. Someone must have gotten the message because when we lined up on approach, we could see emergency equipment racing out to the runway. We had only enough gas for one pass, so if we didn't make it, we were going to end up in the ocean. Sweeney came in high and fast. Too fast. Normal landing speed for the B-29 was about 130 miles per hour. We used up half the strip before we touched down at about 150 miles an hour, a dangerous speed with nearly empty gas tanks. As we touched down, the plane began to swerve to the left and we nearly plowed into a line of B-24s parked along the active runway. Sweeney finally brought the plane under control and as we taxied off the runway, the number two engine quit. Ambulance, staff cars, jeeps, and fire engines quickly surrounded us and a bunch of very jittery people debarked, very glad to be safe on the ground. In fact, the landing was even more dramatic than Olivia describes, for Sweeney was forced to make a sharp 90 degree swerve at the end of the runway to avoid going off a cliff into the sea. As radar countermeasures expert Lieutenant Besser recalled, the centrifugal force resulting from the turn was almost enough to put us through the side of the airplane. You can't come any closer to disaster than we had and live to tell about it. It was 10.30 p.m. when Boxcar finally came to a stop. Immediately upon landing, Sweeney attempted to radio headquarters and deliver his report, but was denied permission without the approval of a general. Thankfully, one just happened to be available, none other than legendary General James Doolittle, who had recently arrived to take command of air operations on Okinawa. As Doolittle listened, Sweeney delivered his mission report, shamefully admitting that he had probably screwed up and missed his target. But Doolittle was more optimistic, reassuring Sweeney that, I'm sure General Spatz will be much happier that the bomb went off in a river valley rather than over the city with the resulting much lower number of casualties. 
Sweeney and his crew remained just long enough for their aircraft to be fueled and repaired before setting off for Tinian, arriving around midnight. As Lieutenant Besser later recalled, their reception was very different than after the Hiroshima mission. There were no crowds to greet these crews, no medal pinning ceremony, only those who would be concerned with our interrogation were there. As Sweeney had feared, Colonel Tibbetts called the mission a fiasco and considered whether to reprimand Sweeney for his conduct. General Curtis LeMay, Chief of Staff for the Strategic Air Forces, confronted Sweeney asking, You f***ed up, didn't you, Chuck? But ultimately decided that an investigation into Sweeney's conduct of the mission would serve no useful purpose. However, in the end, Sweeney received the Distinguished Service Cross, while every member of his crew received the Distinguished Flying Cross for their part in the historic mission. It was nearly a week before the clouds and smoke over Nagasaki cleared and the effects of Sweeney's mission could be assessed. The bomb had detonated 2.4 kilometers northeast of the original target near the Mitsubishi shipyards up the valley of the Urakami River. This was a heavily industrialized area and also the center of Catholicism in Japan. Indeed, Urakami Cathedral lay less than a kilometer from ground zero and all those praying there that morning were killed instantly. But while the Fat Man bomb was nearly 1.5 times more powerful than Little Boy, the overall damage and death toll at Nagasaki was relatively limited compared to Hiroshima, with the hilly terrain helping to contain the blast and subsequent fires. In the end, only 44% of the city was destroyed compared to 60% of Hiroshima, while 100,000 residents were killed or wounded compared to 129,000. As for the bomb's effect on the Japanese government, this was not immediately apparent. With the Japanese maintaining their silence, President Truman thus authorized the use of a third bomb, though this could not be made ready for several months. In the meantime, conventional bombing raids continued, with the 509th dropping its last six pumpkin bombs on Nagoya and Kuroma on August the 14th. Then, the next morning, the moment everyone had been waiting for finally arrived. The Emperor appeared on the radio and announced Japan's unconditional surrender. Eighteen days later, in a ceremony aboard the battleship USS Missouri, delegates of the Japanese government signed the formal instruments of surrender, finally bringing the deadliest conflict in modern history to an end. While the atomic bombing of Nagasaki is often credited with convincing the Japanese to surrender, the event which more likely forced their hand was the Soviet Union's invasion of Japanese-occupied Manchuria, which began the same day. Now facing a war on two fronts and realizing the communist Soviets were unlikely to allow them to keep their emperor, the Japanese war cabinet opted to surrender to the Western allies whom they hoped would offer more reasonable terms. In the end, what the bombs did do was give the emperor a way to save face with his people in such a surrender. From here, Sweeney, like so many others, remained steadfast in his belief that the use of the atomic bombs was entirely justified, stating in a 1995 interview, I saw these beautiful young men who were being slaughtered. There's no question in my mind that President Truman made the right decision. The true vessel of remorse and guilt belonged to the Japanese nation, which could and should call to account the warlords who so willingly offered up their own people to achieve their visions of greatness. As for what happened after dropping the bomb, in November 1945, Sweeney returned to the United States and was posted to Roswell Air Force Base in New Mexico, where he trained air crews for Operation Crossroads, a series of nuclear weapons tests conducted at Bikini Atoll in July 1946. Just a few weeks before the tests, he was honorably discharged from the active service with the rank of lieutenant colonel. In the 1950s, he joined the Massachusetts Air National Guard and coordinated civil defense efforts in Boston, eventually rising to the rank of major general. Following his retirement from the military in 1976, he ran a leather brokerage business. Charles William Sweeney died in Boston on July 16, 2004, at the age of 84. Despite his belief that the atomic bombings of Japan were justified, he hoped that such an action would never again become necessary stating, It is my fervent hope that there will never be another atomic mission. In 1945, we dropped bombs that were primitive in comparison to nuclear weapons today. As the man who commanded the last atomic mission, I pray that I retain that singular distinction.